Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto was blessed by the goddesses with the ultimate dujutsu? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time. Let's begin the story. Naruto laid on the now empty lake bed of the lake at the valley of the end, on the precipice of death, two holes in his jacket. He was breathing heavily and could feel his life slipping away. Next to him was the unconscious body of his former teammate, Uchiha Sasuke, a slash across his hite eight and his body was in slightly better condition than Naruto, he wasn't dying. Approaching fast was one Hitaki Kakashi, sensei to the two boys and their third teammate, Haruno Sakura, as he silently begged to not be too late. His eyes widened in both relief and worry, he saw Sasuke there, but not Naruto. Landing beside the Uchiha, Kakashi looked around for any sign of Naruto. Summoning all his ninkan and ordering them to look for Naruto everywhere, Kakashi tended to Sasuke's wounds, unaware that his target was just beside the Uchiha. Kakashi sensei, I'm right here, can't you, can't you see me? Naruto whispered even in his mind, tears falling from his eyes as he neared death, not understanding why he couldn't see him. Was he doing this on purpose? Was someone else at fault? In the end, it was with malicious intent as it was ensuring his death. Naruto, hanging on to that last bit of hope, didn't blame Kakashi, but vowed vengeance on whoever was at fault here, even if he was dying. He was Uzumaki Naruto, damn it, he made the impossible his. With his summons returning with solemn expression, Kakashi knew all he needed, and hung his head in sorrow, letting the rain hide his tears. Dismissing them, and picking up Sasuke, Kakashi gave one last prayer. Naruto. I'm sorry. I wasn't there for you. I wasn't strong enough to protect you from the villagers' hatred. I wasn't a good teacher. And now. I wasn't here to save you. I'm sorry. With that, he departed the valley and headed for Konoha, traitorous Genin in tow. When he left the valley, the genjutsu hiding Naruto's presence fell. Always a bit inept in the art of genjutsu, Naruto never noticed it was there, nor when it fell. He laid there, slowly dying, looking over his life. Thinking back, he was disappointed with himself. He couldn't see the signs of so many things. Hinata's perfectly clear adoration of him, Sakura's complete disinterest in him, Sasuke's path down darkness from Orochi to me's curse mark. Everything was so obvious, but he didn't notice it until now. And he was dying. Move in. A monotone voice said. Suddenly, ten figures appeared in the clearing, forming a circle around Naruto. They each had their individual quirks, but they all shared one thing. They all wore black cloaks with red clouds. The man leading the group wore an orange spiral mask, a hole over the right eye. He was flanked by two others, a blue-haired woman with an origami flower in her hair and stud piercing under her lower lip, the other was an orange-haired man with a style exactly like Naruto's, soul-piercing rippled grey-purple eyes, and piercings all over his face. Further off was the dynamic duo of Hoshigaki Kisame, a gargantuan man with blue skin and a very shark-like face as he held his precious Samahata over his shoulder, and Uchiha Itachi, a stoic mane, Mangekyo Sharingan blazing as he stared impassively at Naruto. Next was the zombie duo, Kakuzu of Takigakure and the Kinjutsu, Jangu, and Hidan of Yugakure, emissary of the occult Jashin. Next was the artist duo, Akasuna no Sasori, and his Hiroko human puppet, and the effeminate Didera of the Iwagakure bomb division. Lastly was the oddity in Akatsuki, and that saying something, was Zetsu, the plant man, his body half black, half white, as he stared at Naruto. Now is the final step towards my dream, a perfect world. No hate, no war, no anger, just peace. The Kyubi is ours. The frontmost man uttered in his deep, ominous voice. Not. One. Step. Further. A melodious, yet threatening to the group, voice uttered. Looking skyward, Akatsuki saw the heavenly figures of three women as they descended from the sky. Tobi eyed them with mirth. Kill them, he ordered of Kisame and Itachi. Nodding at his order, the duo jumped, intent on finishing the fight quickly only for their very existence to disappear as dust in the wind. Toba's lone eye widened, only to narrow. Didera, Sasori, he said simply. Both artists nodded, understanding their order, and already prepared their strongest attacks, Sasori jumping from his shell and brandishing his puppet body, 
summoning his army of 1,000 puppets, Didara's handmouths creating the clay clone for his C4 technique. Again, they were discarded as dust in the wind. Toby growled at how these women were thinning his numbers. Hidan. Kakuzu. He barked, knowing at least Hidan wouldn't die. His false god would keep him from dying. After this was all done, he would be the only god that mattered. Bring it. U.S. Jashin Sama will relish your blood. Hidan barked as he swung his triple scythe haphazardly, a style kind of there. Kakuzu merely rolled his eyes and summoned all four of his thread creatures and fired a Sweden technique to join their other elemental projectiles. The second woman, in black, grabbed Hidan by his head, the scythe doing nothing against her flawless skin, and tore his soul from his body and crushed it in her hand, ending his existence as his body fell lifelessly to the ground. Toba's eye widened again. Impossible. No one can kill Hidan, not even me, he exclaimed in his mind. The third woman, in green, merely held her hand up, and the deadly wave of elements veered from their course and drained into her hand, leaving nothing behind. Pointing on finger at Kakuzu, the beams of elements returned, splitting into five beams, each piercing all his hearts, killing him as well. The first woman, the one in white, descended on Zetsu and swiped her hand across his chest, bisecting him and causing his remains to turn into a tree, the black half screaming as it was vaporized. Toby looked around as he was now left with two subordinates. Merely glaring at them over his shoulder, they nodded at his silent order, Pain readying his Chibaku Tensai as Conan formed her tell-tale paper wings, whipping up a tornado of the scraps. Again, they were silenced with a wave of the first woman's hand, Pain, all six of his paths, including the original Nagato, and Conan all dying as dust. No. No. I. I am a god. I will not die here. Toby raved madly as he charged at the woman, foregoing his mask, showing his true identity as Obito Uchiha, former friend and teammate of Kakashi thought to be dead on the mission Kakashi received his special eye. And yet. The second woman said, suddenly appearing in his path, grabbing his face. You will. She finished, ripping out his tainted soul and crushing him, ending the existence of Akatsuki. They turned around to their true goal, Uzumaki Naruto. Weakly looking up. He saw the bright light of his end, and gave himself to death, only to feel the warm touch of a slender hand cup his cheek. Naruto kun. Wake up. It's not your time yet. A soothing, melodious voice cooed in his ear. Suddenly feeling the energy to move, Naruto slowly sat up, realizing he felt no fatigue from his wounds. Slowly standing up, Naruto looked around, finding he was surrounded by three beautiful women in an empty white room. The one that had her hand on his cheek was in pure white. Even her long hair was white. This woman seemed to have some odd obsession with the tint, as even her eyeliner, lipstick, nails, and eyelashes were all white. Her eyes were a heavenly honey gold as she smiled at Naruto, rather motherly. She wore long flowing robes that showed her ample cleavage that reminded Naruto of Ba-chan, not that he stared or anything. Her sleeves dangled from right under her shoulders, showing her unblemished skin. Next to her was a woman in stark contrast to her choice of dress. She wore pure black, and her skin was lavender, reminding him of a Hyuga's eyes. Her hair was white, oddly enough, but it was more of a deathly white, in a style like an exaggerated form of Aero Senens, and just above her forehead peeked out two red horns. Her eyes were a pair of black abyss, orange rings for irises as she eyed Naruto with mirth and, was that? The third woman had tanned skin, and the same condition of dress, in forest green but it was torn, showing her midriff and legs that went on for days. She was barefoot and her hair was brown and curled near the tips, giving her a flirtatious look, her bright green eyes staring at Naruto with a combination of the prior women's, stares. Uh. Is this heaven? It's not so bad, though I envisioned more ramen. Hot women are a nice alternative, though. Naruto commented, more to himself but the empty whiteness they were in made his voice echo, the women clearly hearing him and blushing lightly. You're not dead or dying, Naruto-kun. You are much too important to us for you to die. The lavender-skinned woman commented, capturing him in a hug. Though, due to the difference in height, his face was shoved into the valley of heaven, er I mean her. Uh, Shinny-chan. If you keep hugging him like that, he will die from suffocation. The first woman deadpanned. The one suffocating Naruto with affection, and her chest, sweat dropped and giggled nervously releasing the boy from her bosomy prison, laughing as he gasped for air. Eha, sorry Kami-chan. 
Just got caught up in the moment. Besides, look at him. He's an adorable little gaki. She commented as she seized Naruto's cheeks and pinched them like a visiting ant. Ow ow ow. Naruto yelped, waving his arms in the air, frantic for help from the woman assaulting his sensitive cheeks. Realizing she was hurting him, the woman lessened her grip. And those whisker marks make him look like a fox kit. She commented, rubbing her cheek against his. Deep from Naruto's throat, a low rumble sounded, and he purred. All was silent as the group of four just processed what just happened in their heads. Suddenly, the four women tackled the boy, screaming out, kawaii, and rubbing his cheeks and head, eliciting more purrs from him, like a lazy cat. When they finally stopped, Naruto found himself on his back, with a rather nice weight on his waist. Looking up, he blushed horribly as he realized the third woman was straddling his waist, her face red as she panted slightly, grinding her hips against him. He fought a groan that wanted to erupt from his mouth, and managed to squirm away from under her. Now is not the time for that. Kami commented, lifting the woman up by her robes, ignoring Naruto's indignant squawks about being molested. She was completely serious now. Naruto-kun, do you know who we are? She asked. Naruto shook his head, still trying to wrap his brain around the first thing that was said. He just took a fist of lightning to his heart and he wasn't going to die. What the hell is going on? We are the three goddesses that watch over your world. I am Kami, goddess of heaven, life, and light, the first said. I am Shinigami, goddess of hell, death, and darkness, the lavender beauty added. And I am Tozi, goddess of nature, the final said. And we have been watching you. Uzumaki Namikaze Naruto, they said together. Naruto was silent as his brain tried to reboot itself after this influx of input, I mean process what the just happened. These were the three goddesses that watched over the elemental nations and they were watching him. The Kyubi brat? Why me? He asked quietly, but the women heard. You have massive potential, and we aim to see it brought to fruition. You are the key to true peace for this world. Something went wrong in this world's history and it is now diseased, stricken with hatred. Naruto-kun, we are going to give you several special gifts, then send you back in time so you can redo your life, and bring the world down the correct path. You have many things ahead of you, Naruto-kun, and we aim to help you. Kami explained as she approached Naruto. Whoa 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 what gifts? Naruto asked, only for further questions to be silenced as Kami seized his lips with her own, thrusting her tongue into his mouth, engaging his own in a sensual war as Naruto felt his body change. Kami stepped back, a flirtatious smirk on her face at Naruto's reddened face, only for Shinigami to jump in and repeat the process, only adding in a little more. She raised her right leg a little bit, straddling it around Naruto's, as she grabbed his hand and brought it to her breast, moaning into the as she grinded her hips against him, causing him to groan in return, again feeling a change build within him. Shinigami stepped back, thoroughly satisfied for now, as she eyed the boy with open, especially the tent in his pants. After he was thoroughly molested, Naruto looked at the two women incredulously, only to be tackled by the final woman, Tozi. She seemed to continue what she started before, seizing his lips and grinding her hips against his manhood through his pants. Before anything could be accomplished, the final change was built inside Naruto, and Tozi was pulled away, the three of them watching him be engulfed in a bright light. The light faded, and a new Naruto was born. Standing from the epicenter of the light, Naruto stood tall, taller than he was before. Now he was 5 feet 10 inches, his body toned and built to perfection, but not to the extent of a bodybuilder. His clothes were a bit tight for his new body, his pants now downgraded to shorts, and his jacket was forced open, the mesh undershirt stretching to accommodate him just fine. He smirked as he opened his eyes, and showed his new dujutsu. The new dujutsu. Hakumegan, twilight eye, his sclera black, his irises forest green, and his pupils an ever-changing myriad of colors, like a rainbow, as in the very center was a white star, like a compass rose. You now have power of light and can heal any injury of the mind, body and soul. Kami explained her contribution to Naruto's gifts. You have power over darkness and can injure the soul, Shinigami explained. You now have control over all the elements, including what you humans call sub-elements, you can talk to and understand animals and insects, and your senses are as great as any of them. Tozi added. Your eyes are the combination of the three dujutsu, Sharingan, Byakugan, and Rinnegan, and it is constantly evolving. 
Eventually, if you can think it, you can do it. We also uploaded every jutsu into your brain and you can accomplish them without hand seals and saying the name and perfect control. Kami explained again. This time, she raised her hands to the sky, nine colored lights forming in her grasp. She thrust them towards Naruto, watching them be absorbed into his body, more specifically, the seal. And you now hold all the biju, brought together and remade into the jubi. You will have perfect control over its chakra. Now we send you back. You better not disappoint Naruto-kun. Kami finished with a flirtatious wink as a portal opened and Naruto was sucked in. She turned to her sisters. Well girls, looks like we got a little talk with Konoha. She said cheerfully. Too cheerfully. We gonna them up? Shinigami asked with her evil grin. Oh, wheel them up real good. She answered with her own grin as the descended on Konoha. The elemental nations just lost the strongest village, by an act of the gods. With Naruto. Naruto was flying through the portal of reality as he made his journey back in time. The Naruto in the past was currently snickering as he marveled over his artwork, he had just repainted the Hokage monument. Suddenly, he was engulfed in a white light, and was replaced with the newly changed Naruto from the future. Naruto looked around, finding he was at the exact point where one of the more misunderstanding Anbu attacked him, not just for what he did. He sighed as he sensed the chakra signature of Unagi. Hello. Unagi Teme. Naruto drawled. Demon. Unagi said out loud, brandishing his tanto. Naruto sighed. We really gonna do this? He asked, only for his answer to be a rush of the Anbu baying for his blood. He sighed again and thrust his hand forward, his arm instantly turning into stone and several shards forming on it. With a mental command of, Iwafubuki, they flew forward, catching the Anbu off guard with a child knowing an elemental jutsu costing him his life as the shards peppered his body, eventually piercing most of his vital organs, resulting in a near instant death. Staring at the body disinterestedly, Naruto subsequently disappeared in a yellow flash, appearing home, ignoring the ensuing havoc his killing of an Anbu created. He sighed, he seemed to be doing that a lot lately. Looking around his little home, Naruto sighed at the dilapidated abode. I dealt with this for twelve years. He quietly questioned. Shaking his head, he grabbed one of the small clay figures he procured from a trash can and used chakra to mold it, using his new explosion release to make the clay from his old life useful. Breaking it apart into smaller bits, Naruto successfully formed four clay spiders and sent them to the four corners of his apartment as he left, walking towards the Hokage Tower. If everything went as planned, they would be put to use. Upon entering the tower, Naruto ignored the secretary's attempts to stop him, claiming the Hokage was busy and eventual threats of bringing in the Anbu. Opening and closing the door silently, Naruto walked into the office, frowning at his grandfather figure. Ji-san, we need to talk. Naruto said plainly. Naruto-kun? Is everything okay? You seem. Subdued. Hiruzen commented. Indeed, Naruto seemed as if he had a great weight on his shoulders. His eyes lacked that normal vibrancy he knew to expect of Naruto. Look, I'm going to cut to the chase. I know about my inheritance. Naruto responded. Indeed, alongside the Jutsu Kami, Shinigami, and Tozi gifted him with, they also provided him with information they felt pertinent to his life, such as his parents, the truth of the night of his birth, and the two main figures at fault for the previous timeline's state of affairs, Uchiha Obito and Black Zetsu. They explained that Zetsu was the manifested will of the Rakudu Senen's mother, Otsutsuki Kagaya, and he manipulated the entirety of shinobi history in a convoluted plan to revive Kagaya, masquerading himself as an ally and pawn of Obito, who planned to enact the Tasuki no Mi to bring the world under one giant genjutsu, to erase pain and hatred and war. Of course, that was some heavy shit, so Serutobi didn't need to know that. Oh, also, J.I.I. Sans alive, it took all of Naruto's willpower to not break down when he saw the final, definitive proof that this was the past, the Sandame was alive and well. Hiruzen's eyes turned hard, and he dismissed his Anbu and put up a privacy technique. Explain. He demanded. This was not Naruto's J.I.I. San. This was the Shinobi no Kami, the Purofessa, the Sandame Serutobi Hiruzen. Would you believe me if I said the Kayubi told me? Naruto offered with a raised brow and flat tone. To be honest, that was, not even half true, more like a third true. The Kayubi was now replaced with the Jubi, who was, quite amorous towards her new container, and she didn't tell him anything, 
other than things she'd do to him when he was older. But then again, Naruto couldn't exactly say, I came from the future, and three goddesses told me on my deathbed and sent me back in time with god hack powers to save the world. Hiruzen's eyes turned sharp as daggers, and he was not amused. How did you find out about it? And how can you even trust it? He asked incredulously. To be honest, it's probably the only one I can trust in this entire village, that includes you since you kept this from me. Naruto responded, taking the first step towards some much needed venting. Sarutobi's eyes turned heavy with sorrow and guilt. Naruto kun, you must understand why I didn't tell you. Your father had many enemies, both inside and outside of the village, and. And what, you thought I would blab that secret once you told me? Did you really think I was that stupid as a kid? If you told me, then said this was a dangerous secret, I wouldn't have run around, screaming that I was the Yandaimi's son. I thought you trusted me, Hokage sama. Naruto interrupted, using his professional title to show just how much Hiruzen had fallen in his eyes. Growing up alone, Naruto was forced to understand the negatives and positives of his actions, to avoid further scrutiny by the villages, so he most certainly wouldn't have ran around the village screaming something like that everywhere he went. But apparently, his J.I.I. San didn't think he was that smart. Hiruzen recoiled as if physically struck, before he realized the truth in Naruto's words, and his eyes, and heart, grew heavier with grief and regret. Naruto-kun. I'm sorry. I'm sorry this old fool couldn't see something so obvious, he apologized vehemently. Just give me my inheritance so I can leave, Naruto demanded, now thoroughly annoyed. Without speaking, the Sandame got up and undid the Fuenjutsu hidden safe behind the Yandaimi's portrait, which Hiruzen swore was scowling at him, and retrieved two scrolls. This one is a letter from your parents, it has the key to the estate and instructions on entering the gate, and the second has techniques they each wanted to pass to you. He explained, giving the blonde his birthright, also adding a small note with directions to the estate. Silently, Naruto nodded and left, scowling at the secretary with such ferocity that her ing died in her throat. Namikaze Estate. Naruto looked up at the abandoned home, having passed through the gate by administering blood and chakra, finding it was in near perfect condition, oddly enough. Just some cracks and cobwebs, nothing a few cage bunshin could solve. Speaking of which, without even a single twitch, five bunshin poofed into existence. Get started on fixing this mess. He ordered, sitting down to read his parents' letter after handing the key to one of the clones. He started with the Yandaimis first. Hey there. Naruto I guess you know this is from your dad. I'm sure I'm supposed to write something about life lessons I wanted to impart on you that I can't in person because of. You know, the Kyubi and all, but I'm drawing a blank right now. I'm sure your mother has that covered. I don't really have a lot of time to talk here, the Kyubi is currently wrecking the village. But I suppose if there was any moment for me to get sentimental, I think this would be it. Depending on whose letter you read first, or if Hiruzen told you this, but when I first met your mother, we didn't exactly hit it off, it wasn't one of those, love at first sight, kind of things you see in bad romance movies. No, we sort of hated each other, she was loud and abrasive, sometimes violent, and I was, to quote Kashina Chan, flaky. Naruto had a good laugh at that, considering those were his first thoughts when he saw the Yandaimi's face before he chose him as his idol and hero. Anyway, we didn't really get to know each other until she was kidnapped by some Kumo bastards, something about her special chakra. Anyway, she left strands of her hair for me to follow, and I saved her. After that, we started working together a lot, then we fell in love. We got married during my reign as Hokage, but due to that same fact, we had to keep it hidden. When I first found out I was going to be a father, I fainted. Naruto had another laugh at the thought of the second most powerful shinobi from Konoha, right behind the Shodime, fainting like a scared goat. Yeah, yeah, have your laugh. Holy crap, mind reading letter. After I came to, I was probably the happiest man in the world, and Kashina chan was even happier. We couldn't wait for you to come into our lives, and when the day finally came, we were even happier. Then the Kyubi came to shit all over it. A snort. Everything is falling down around me, pieces of the ceiling are bouncing off my head. I know what I have to do to stop the Kyubi and save Konoha. Naruto, I'm sorry, I don't do this to curse you. I do it because I know you are strong enough to turn this around. No matter what people say, 
you're a hero to Konoha. And I couldn't be more proud to be your father. I love you more than anything, and I know you'll come a long way in this world. Remember that, no matter what, we'll always love you. Your mother isn't exactly in a position to write for herself, but I'm writing for her, this is her part. Hey Sochi Kun, it's mom. I'm not really up for holding a pen and paper, in fact, I'm losing a lot of blood. Most Jinchuriki don't survive having their biju taken out, and I'm only alive for now because of our Uzumaki heritage. We sure as hell can take a beating. Minato kun told me what he plans to do to stop the Kaiubi, and while I don't 100% agree with it, I know it's really the only way to stop it. I won't last much longer, so I'll make this quick. You're going to experience a lot of pain and suffering, trust me, I know. But never lose your path, remember who you are. Find a goal, a dream, and don't stop trying until it comes true. There's so much more I want to say to you, to teach you. I want to stay with you, and see the man you grow up into. My precious Sochi kun, I love you. Your parents, Namikaze Minato and Uzumaki Kashina. On then the tears, Naruto signaled as, indeed, he had tears falling from his eyes. This letter was the answer to the biggest question he had since he could remember did his parents love him? And the answer was yes, incredibly so. When Mizuki told him he held the Kaiubi, or was it, but were splitting hairs here, he felt a bit of resentment towards the Yondaimi. Why did he do this? Was it to curse him? Was he really the only choice that night? Now he knew. His father had faith in him to be the hero of Konoha, to hold the beast on incalculable power back with his willpower alone. It wasn't a curse, despite the Kaiubis, less than friendly nature. And Naruto knew even if there were other children born that night, that his father couldn't ask of those parents something he wouldn't be willing to do himself. Naruto belonged to a family of heroes. Sighing with a truly content smile, Naruto refolded the letter and tucked it away into one of his pockets. He didn't look at the jutsu they left because, obviously, he already knew them. In fact, he knew every jutsu that was, is, and maybe will be. And he had them mastered to perfection, as well as the Jubi's chakra, ignoring the purring at the mere mention of her, so what was there to do? Well, now that he thought about it, their gifts seemed to specify actual techniques, like ninjutsu and genjutsu, and while he knew taijutsu and bukijutsu techniques, he didn't actually have a style that fit himself. So he would need to rectify that. Oh, and he should work on the Rasengan. Erosenin mentioned that the Yondaimi, it was still a bit too soon to call him too san already, never took the technique to the next step, which was incorporating elemental manipulation, because of his untimely death. So Naruto could work on that, and then he had to familiarize himself with the powers of his new dujutsu, and there was still that business about it being able to, evolve, however that would work. Oh, wait, Naruto just realized, before putting his hand up in a one-handed Torah seal. Katsu. His apartment went up in flames, the blonde putting the spiders to use, he didn't need the place anymore, and it would just be a reminder of his weak self. He didn't really care about the repercussions, since he had a new home, anyway. He also overheard the landlord plan to have the building demolished anyway. With him inside, asshat. Next step, he needed new clothes. While his current body didn't reflect his new form once the goddesses, upgraded, him, he planned to rectify a whole lot of things. As far as he knew, he would appear how he was remade in his mindscape only, for now. He was about to leave the compound to go to his favorite shop for supplies, Higurashi's Forge, until he realized that, as he was now, he wasn't a shinobi yet, so they wouldn't sell him anything, even if Ichiban-san was nice. He also realized he had a technique that could fix his problem, anyway. On Anjutsu, what can't you do? Okay. So Yin, Naruto looked to his right hand, and it now cradled a black flame. Dot and Yang, his left held a white blaze. To create from nothingness, he brought his hands together and closed his eyes to concentrate on the very technique that created the biju, the banbutsu no suzu. In a flash of light and chakra, Naruto's clothes changed to fit his new design. He kept the mesh underneath, but his shirt turned into a simple black uniform style jacket with an orange zipper two stripes near the bottom, and one at each elbow with the rest of the sleeve from where a second stripe would start becoming orange. 
He had the kanji for the three goddesses across his shoulders and a red armband on his left bicep with the uzumaki swirl. His shorts turned into full-length pants that remained orange from the knees up, but became black from there down. He still had his kanai pouch tied to his right thigh, and he changed his sandals to black copies. Yeah, that's nice. Naruto looked down at himself with a smile, while he knew that Shinobi didn't wear orange, but Naruto didn't care. Orange was awesome, but he made a compromise and added black, which looked nice. Now, what should I move on to next? Hmm, let's go with the Rasengan. It'll be easier than deciding a Taijutsu style for myself, what with my indecisiveness, and I'll think over whether to take up Kenjutsu afterwards. He admitted. Raising his right hand, Naruto instantly formed the grinding sphere, then raised his left hand and channeled fire chakra, the element being the most prominent in Haino Kuni. Fire release chakra is formed by superheating one's chakra. Applying that to the Rasengan, Naruto brought his hands close together, almost instantly applying the elemental chakra to the Rasengan due to his mastery of jutsu. The jutsu of the Yandaimi turned red-orange and was set ablaze. Naruto frowned at the simplicity of the technique. Well that didn't accomplish much. Now I'm just holding a fireball, it'll just be a hot Rasengan. Well, it might still be a viable technique. Let's see. Creating a clone with the command to creating a normal Rasengan, both Naruto's took a stance to charge before kicking off towards each other. The techniques met in the center, and a struggle began, though it was short-lived, as the elemental Rasengan quickly overpowered the normal version dispelling the clone once its torso was set aflame around the impact area. Huh, did not think it would be that much better. Guess it's viable, after all. This can only mean one thing. His face became stern and serious. I'm a ing genius. He struck a pose guy and Lee would be proud of, gleaming shit-eating grin for all to see. At that moment, all of the clones had received the memories of the defeated one and one of the few in Naruto's view gave him a thumbs up for the technique in his new clothes. Good to know. I, approve of my tastes in clothes. Naruto chuckled. So we got a Kaden. Rasengan, I guess I should try the other elements, and maybe. I dunno, stronger versions. I've seen the shit some of these elements can do, so it would only make sense that the already crazy strong Rasengan can seriously wreck some shit if you throw in an element or two. He, reasoned. From the future, blessed by goddesses, in the end it didn't matter, Naruto was still Naruto, and Naruto liked things that went boom. Just as quickly as he made the Kaden variant, Naruto made the other four in fifteen or so minutes, observing the various effects the elements had on the Rasengan. Water gave it small tides that orbited it, and created a large, forceful splash when it hit something. It actually knocked over the tree Naruto used as a target. Wind gave it small blades, like a few shuriken, and created incalculably numerous cuts on the target. Lightning actually shrank the Rasengan a bit, to about two-thirds its size, and crackled with electricity. Attacking with it actually pierces the target, as some trees around the blonde could attest to. Finally, earth release was a bit difficult, due to its nature as solid, slow, and generally unmoving, but Naruto managed to make it work, it actually turned the Rasengan into a little morning star, with rock shards creating spikes that orbited the sphere. Using this technique and allowed him to tap into his inner brute and just smash. And then it exploded with rock shards. Ow. Pleased with his progress, and seeing it was only around 2 p.m., Naruto moved on with his to-do list, leaving the super versions of the elemental Rasengan later in exchange for more overall progress. The next thing he mentioned was, Actually, hey, Jubi, he received a belligerent, a hem, and mentally sighed. Kashin Chan, yes, Naruto was also surprised when the Jubi decided she wanted a name. Granted, he was surprised when it turned out to be a woman, and appeared to him as a human, but when he saw her true form, he preferred talking to a human face than a whatever sort of animal that form could be categorized as, or a tree. Anyway, the Jubi decided to combine. Shinju, the tree, with the woman from which all chakra originated, Otsutsuki Kegaya, thus, Kashin. She had also taken a shine to Naruto quite fast, once she heard the goddess's plans to fix the elemental nations, a journey to peace. Kashin's human form was similar to Tsunade Ba-chan's in ahem, dimensions, but since she could change it at will, 
she decided to pull several characteristics from her pseudo Jinchuriki and her legitimate one, the Raikudo Senen. Her hair was the most brilliant white that fell down in a curtain at her feet, and her skin was ashen, but Naruto didn't particularly find it unattractive or strange. She had Kagaya's third eye, the Rinne Sharingan, and her normal eyes were the Senen's Rinnegan, and she had a pair of horns sprouting from her forehead. Her eyebrows were rounded as a sign of nobility and she wore crimson lipstick, which was a stark contrast to her skin. She dressed like Tsunade, as well, wearing a silver kimono-style blouse with black trim and obi tied underneath her, purposely accentuating them, possibly to tease Naruto, and the long sleeves that nearly covered her hands, with black fingernails, had black magatama around their cuffs. She actually wore black hakama with white magatama around the cuffs, and she went barefoot. Yes, Naru kun. The Jubi responded with a wide smile. She enjoyed talking to the blonde every time, since she was either stuck with the power obsessed Kagaya, or the always serious Raikudo Senen, Hagoromo. The blonde was a nice change of pace, and she had several plans for their future. What does having mastery over your chakra entail, anyway? Is it something like that cloak I got during my fight with Sasuke Tem? Naruto asked, curious over the matter though frowning at the fresh memory. Something along those lines, having mastery over my chakra is like having mastery of all the other biju's chakra, so you have access to their abilities. As my Jinchuriki, you also have access to Raikudo Senjutsu, a heightened state of Senjutsu that enables you immense power, access to the Gudodama, and levitation. She explained whilst lounging on a large rock in the field that now represented Naruto's new mindscape. Single quote dot dot dot. Okay, you lost me at Senjutsu. I also don't know what the other biju can do besides Shukaku. Naruto responded flatly. Kashin sighed but couldn't exactly blame the boy. Such massive amounts of information wouldn't come easy, especially given his normal thought process, but it was slowly, but surely being fixed with every second, as was evident by his application of elemental chakra theory. Of course, Having never encountered Senjutsu in his previous timeline, he wouldn't know about it, and thus couldn't completely comprehend that area of his new knowledge. Senjutsu is the art of sensing and taking in natural energy, the aura of the world, and balancing it with your physical and spiritual energy to reach new heights of strength. Normally, learning and using Senjutsu has a certain risk, as those who can't balance their energies are turned into statues for all eternity. However, as my Jinchuriki, it comes to you naturally, so you are safe. Also, usually the second you became my Jinchuriki you would have permanently entered Raikudo Senjutsu, but Kami-sama made it where you can enter and exit it willingly, you just need to open your senses to nature and it will happen automatically. To exit, just close yourself off from nature, I recommend trying it now to familiarize yourself with it. She advised. Uh, okay, Naruto responded, unsure but willing to try anyway. He sat in the middle of the field and closed his eyes, wondering how exactly he would go about, opening his senses to nature, but decided it might need him to quiet his thoughts, as was usual of most meditation. He slowed his breathing and just thought about nature. As time passed, he experienced a sort of out-of-body experience, as he observed himself with his mind's eye sitting in blackness. Slowly, some sort of green energy came from the edges of his sight and converged on his body. He felt the energy invade his body, but it was a pleasant experience, filling him with warmth as it finally reached the center of his chakra circulatory system and joined the spiritual and physical energies in a triumvirate. The second it did, he felt his body explode with power and change. The black in his clothing turned white, and the orange a pale red, as magatama of the same hue formed around the collar of his jacket and the rinnegan pattern formed on the back, above nine tomo in a 3x3 pattern his clothing flickering as if it were made of flames. Finally, horns actually grew from his forehead and his skin paled slightly. He slowly opened his eyes and looked down at himself. Whoa! This feels… amazing. I feel like I'm a part of something bigger than myself. He commented calmly before trying to get up. He ended up floating above the ground once his legs straightened out. Oh, there's that levitation you mentioned. Cool. Anything else I should know? Naruto asked coolly, taking everything in stride. Well, you can create chakra arms since you are covered in chakra, and have access to the Gudodama. She offered simply, enjoying the sun shining down on her, lazing out on the rock by now. 
Nearly humming inquisitively, Naruto reached his arm out towards a tree and concentrated on the chakra covering it before willing it to form. Quickly enough, the chakra on his arm came to life and extended into a long, clawed arm that stretched all the way to touch the tree, which was a considerable distance, considering Naruto was still in the middle of the field. Smiling softly at the capabilities of this ability, Naruto retracted it, but kept it out for something he wanted to try. With the base of it having moved to his back, Naruto willed a certain amount and type of chakra through it and smiled when the Kaden, Rasengan formed in its grasp. Dispelling it in the arm, Naruto looked over his shoulder at the black orbs behind him, one of them moving around to be in front of him for ease of viewing. I can control these with my thoughts. That's pretty neat. What do they do, and what exactly are they? He asked. They utilize the power of Shinra Bansho and shape manipulation to achieve, well, almost anything. They work like Jintan, in that they can, upon your desire, nullify all ninjutsu. They can form weapons shields, chakra receivers, arms, and can heal you. They use all five natures, and yin-yang release. As Kashin explained them, the orbs all turned into stuff like swords, lances, shields, platforms, rods, and arms seemingly made of double helices. Wow, that's a bit scary. I'll save that type of thing for rare occasions. Naruto decided, before touching down in the field and attempting to cut off his connection to nature. Problems arose when it proved difficult, the natural energy proved, could energy be called, clingy. If so, then the natural energy proved so, as it felt like it didn't want to leave him. But of course, Naruto couldn't exactly walk around in all white, covered in flaming chakra, and sporting a pair of horns, now could he? Thankfully, he succeeded, and lost his new features. Okay, that was weird. I felt all, mellow and, shit. Is this what Senjutsu does? Naruto asked his new tenant, not caring that he appeared to be talking to himself, while also thankful that, thanks to his new jutsu knowledge, which included fuinjutsu, he found several seals around the perimeter that created a sort of distortion dome around the complex. To anyone on the outside, Naruto actually wouldn't even be there. It came in handy to revert all attempts at spying on the boy pointless, and it could hide anything barring something like an explosion bigger than the dome, or a biju. After a quick giggle at his description, Kashin responded. Sort of. When you take in natural energy, you are assimilating the very essence of the earth. Most of the time, nature is at peace and serene, of course, there are also moments when nature will show everyone else who's boss and start wrecking some shit. But most of the time, Senjutsu tends to calm the mind, Raikudo Senjutsu especially, given its origin. She explained. Well, given its capabilities, I'll leave it for serious fights, like Orochimaru. Just thinking of the Sanin caused his to grit his teeth in fury. If it wasn't for Orochimaru, Sasuke wouldn't have gotten the curse mark and attempted to desert Konoha, and he wouldn't have died. Hey boss, a clone snapped him out of that line of thinking. When he got his creator's attention, he thumbed at the estate over his shoulder. Cleanup's done. Anything else you need us for? He asked. Happy the sprucing was done, Naruto thought it over, he planned to train in his dujutsu, and considering most of them could see chakra, and the Byakugan the tenkutsu especially, as well as who knows what else, it would be wise to have at least one clone around. Just you, the others can dispel. I'll be working on the dujutsu next. He ordered. Okay then. You heard, I am, boys, bug off. The clone took a kanai and threw it at a clone to dispel it, thus sending the memory of the clones no longer being needed. Several pomps echoed throughout the compound, signaling the end of the clones. Okay, so since our Hakumigan is a fusion of the Byakugan, Sharingan, and whatever the hell the Rinnegan is, we'll start with the first. So then, Naruto closed his eyes before snapping them open, the exotic design of his deified dujutsu on display. With it active, he automatically saw the chakra that constituted his clone, unfortunately, given the nature of any clone technique, he couldn't see any tenkutsu, for there were none. Okay, ye and boo, I can see chakra, but you have no tenkutsu for me to see. You try using it and tell me if you can see mine. Naruto asked of his clone, who merely nodded and activated their dujutsu, honing in on Naruto. Whoa. They said together at what happened the second the clone activated its dujutsu, they saw each other through their opposite. 
Naruto had a secondary field of view through the clone, and the clone vice versa. Okay, I never heard of the Sharingan or Byakugan doing this, so is this the Rinnegan's power? Naruto asked rhetorically, but Kashin answered anyway. One of them, the Rinnegan actually has seven central paths, which each have their own powers. This shared vision is part of the Gedu, which also entails the manifestation of chakra receivers you can form from your own body, chains strong enough to bind even the Biju, and resurrect the dead, at the cost of your own life force. Tendo deals in gravity manipulation, Gakido lets you absorb all forms of chakra, either through jutsu or physical contact, Jigokudo, interrogating through using the king of hell. If they lie or refuse to answer, it takes their soul, and if they tell the truth, they just pass out from exhaustion, and restoring damage to bodies. Shirado temporarily turns you into a machine, filled with numerous weapons, Chikishudo lets you summon different animals, and Ninjendo allows you to read someone's mind by ripping out their soul. Kashin lectured so he wouldn't be in the dark on a large part of his abilities. Quote dot dot dot, damn, that is so broken. But I don't care cuz it's mine now. Naruto responded with a large grin. Well, guess I should work on those, then the Sharingan. So, I imagine the chains are made the same way as my Ka Sans. Naruto commented, before the information he wanted entered his mind. When he knew what he was looking for, it was easy to find. Channeling the chakra as was needed through his Hakumigen, which added as a Rinnegan proxy, black chains extended from his sleeves. Content with that, while knowing he couldn't exactly test how much they could restrain without raising a few red flags in the village, he moved on to the chakra receivers. Channeling dense chakra to various spots on his arms, several black rods grew out of his skin. Oh ho ho ke, that feels weird, Naruto commented, cutting off the flow and shaking his arms. Naruto accidentally sent them flying, dispelling his clone in the process, before twitching for a second. Okay. Apparently they disrupt chakra. That also felt weird, he discovered, not up for bringing back the dead, so let's work on those paths. He decided. For the next hour or so, Naruto familiarized himself with the Raikudo no Jutsu and each of its abilities, though he wasn't amused with the results or Jigokudo and Ninjendo. With the former, his clone said he was the best boss ever, and the king of hell killed it. So it lied, with Ninjendo, after yanking its soul out, which was technically a part of his soul, so it returned to him either way, he read its mind. You're a shitty boss, are all his clones assholes? Anyway, after that, he moved on to the Sharingan portion, which, to his knowledge, didn't really give him a whole lot. It just allowed him to perceive his clone's actions before it even moved. The jutsu copying was useless, since he knew all of them. All in all, the Sharingan part was supremely disappointing. Until Kashin mentioned there was a whole slew of abilities he never encountered. She told him about the Mangeku and Aen Mangeku Sharingan, and the abilities they garnered. Naruto was perfectly fine with the Genjutsu by eye contact, Sukuyomi. He was willing to accept the Eternal Flame by eyesight, Amaterasu. What he didn't buy was the giant flaming warrior, Suzano. Seeing as there was nothing he could do about it, he just familiarized himself with the three techniques, as well as these supposed personal abilities that appeared for certain Uchiha. Thought he tried to be quick with his use of Suzano, as Naruto wasn't 100% sure if the barrier could contain it for extended periods of time. Kamui was pretty cool, both the intangibility and teleportation parts, and the Koto Amatsukami was a bit terrifying in how powerful it was in the manipulation of memories and genuine mind control. He wasn't even going to try Tengai Shinsei, though, he wasn't about to drop a pair of comets for the sake of training. Can you even call this training? That would mean he was refining and perfecting his techniques, and, we've been over this. Anyway, the Byakugan proved to be a welcome change of pace from the absolute bullshit being broken as shit from the Sharingan and Rinnegan. 360 degrees of vision, once 359, but utilizing that portion almost instantly, evolved it, to a complete circle. So that's what they meant. That probably won't be the extent of it, though, for the future, about 50 meters of extended vision, X-ray vision, though the barrier around the compound blocked his vision to the rest of the village, so there was a limitation, and the ability to see the Tenkutsu, chakra pathways, and even elemental affinities. Thank you again, shared vision, 
though that last one was a weird quirk. Not much in comparison to the aforementioned Dujutsu, but it got really good when brought hand in hand with the Jukin. Unfortunately, he couldn't really train in it because a normal strike, enhanced with chakra or not, would dispel his only medium for training it, clones, so he couldn't tell if he was doing it correctly or not. And he didn't exactly want to subject himself to letting a clone do it to him, f that noise so hard. So he settled for what he could, which included Neji's Hakusho Kaden, so that was fun. Getting his body used to using the Jukin was a task in and of itself, since it required smooth, fluid movements, and a level of grace he wasn't accustomed to. But of course, like anything else, Naruto persisted, and got himself acclimated enough. With that, he tried his hand at stuff like Juaho Shoshikin, Haku Kusho, and the insane Yasogami Kugeki. Of course, he had to send that last one skyward, since he'd flattened many trees with the giant fists it projected. Kashin Chan mentioned that last technique was something called a Keke Mora, one of few techniques belonging solely to Otsutsuki Kegaya, the human progenitor of all chakra, and her clan. She also mentioned that the aforementioned clan had a dujutsu of their own, but he couldn't assimilate its properties until he met another Otsutsuki, so he could properly observe their chakra. Until then, he'd have that carrot dangling in front of her. Anyway, now came the defining moment, choosing a taijutsu style. And maybe kenjutsu, of course, he technically knew them all but trying to incorporate all of them into his fighting style would be insane. Then again, just choosing one would be a waste of resources, so maybe, three. He could switch between them on the fly, or maybe combine them. Going along that vein, he might even eventually find some way to incorporate them all, using bits and pieces to create an entirely new style. A daunting task, but Uzumaki Naruto was known for doing that type of stuff on a daily basis. Sorting through all the jutsu he knew, Naruto found three styles that intrigued him, while chuckling at one of them. He chose Kakurin Disturbance for its unpredictability and versatility. While it was originally a Kenjutsu style, it can easily be adapted for Taijutsu, Kajkin Shadow Fist for its focus on attacking the opponent's weak points for maximum damage, and Kitsun Sum Fox Claw for its speed and strength, focusing on an animal-like stance and the use of chakra to enhance attacks. Naruto spent the rest of the day familiarizing himself with the katas for each style, and working on switching between them mid-fight. By the time he felt okay with that progress, it was already night, and Naruto felt today was full of progress, yet also mentally and emotionally draining. Thankful it was a Saturday, actually, the Saturday before his graduation exam where Mizuki showed his true colors, and that he would have tomorrow to continue his work, Naruto went inside and found the master bedroom putting his parents' letter in one of the drawers for safekeeping, and just flopped onto the bed for the night. Naruto dreamt of the hell he would reign in the coming months, doing all he can to fix the vents from his past for the better. He would officially pass the exam, he would save Haku and Zabuza, he would protect his team from Orochimaru, he would save Ji-san, and he would stop Sasuke from deserting the village, Juin or no. After that, it was anyone's game. Uzumaki Naruto would raise some shit. It was 10 a.m., Sunday today, so Naruto had another free day to train, and he planned to use it for physical exercises to get his body to the peak condition it was when the goddesses rejuvenated him. Thankfully, the backyard of the Namikaze estate was the perfect thing for that. It was large enough for sprinting, and was surrounded by trees which he could use to build up his physical endurance with punches and kicks, using his enhanced healing factor to fix the damage. His already crazy healing ability from the Kyubi was now even crazier thanks to Raikudo Senjutsu, with this specific facet being passive and thus imbued to him even when outside it. With all that in mind, Naruto decided to use the training regimen he created back when Team 7 first started, consisting of a 6-mile run, 100 push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, and punches to the heavy bag that had Kakashi Sensei's face on it. Of course, the list also had ninjutsu training but, yeah. He'd also be substituting the heavy bag with trees, and throwing in 100 kicks. That sounded a lot more painful than he initially thought. Oh well, too late now. With that in mind, he began with the run. The backyard of the estate, which would be better called its own training field, was about a third of a mile when he ran its entire perimeter, so he'd have to circumvent it 18 times for the 6 miles. 
Creating a clone where he stood to keep track of his progress, Naruto took off. Thirty minutes later, that went a lot better than he expected. He barely built up a sweat, thinking against doing it again. For now, Naruto moved on to the push-ups and planned to go through the whole list and see how it fared against his possibly enhanced stamina and modifying the list accordingly. One hour later, 100 push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, punches, and kicks, those last two being a bit painful but subsiding halfway through, amounted to, not much against his stamina. So, from there he would double it and see where it got him. About another hour and a half later, it got him to start sweating, which was a good sign, but not good enough. Slightly cursing his new monstrous stamina, Naruto went for a third go, and came to regret it afterwards, yet appreciated it at the same time. Is this what it's like to be exhausted? If so, it kinda sucks. But this is good, this is my limit, so it's a benchmark to start from for these exercises. 18 miles, resulting in 54 trips around the field, and 300. All of that, managed to naturally exhaust someone like me. Though, I guess my fight with Gara exhausted me, too. Dot dot, oh well, so, what should I do now? I could make new jutsu, or get to know more of the ones I have. Actually, I feel like having some ramen. I haven't seen a Yame Ne Chan and Chuki Oji San in a while. Technically, time travel is weird. Deciding on that, Naruto got to his feet and hobbled his way through his house, losing the limp halfway through as his aches and pains were healed away, and locked the door and gate behind him as he ventured into the village. Unfortunately, the first thing he ran into was the Sandame's less than pleased face, which scared the out of the poor boy, causing him to stumbling back, falling on his ass. JG's, JII San, you scared me, don't do that, Naruto said as he slowly got back to his feet. Naruto, Hiruzen started, causing Naruto to worry at the lack of the affectionate suffix. Care to explain to me why, soon after I gave you your new home, your apartment, exploded. Sarutobi asked, radiating weak killing intent that, even though it wasn't directed at the boy, still scared Naruto. Naruto paled, shit, I didn't think that through. I just wanted to erase the center of all my bad memories. In hindsight, it was exceedingly stupid and dangerous. What do I say? What do I say? Uh, maybe play it off as not knowing. What? I didn't know about that. I planned to keep that place as a storage unit. Was I? Was I really close to dying, J.I.I. San? Is anyone else hurt? The quiver in his voice was partially genuine, as he didn't intend for anyone to get hurt, or die, from his moment of spite. Sarutobi laid off on the killing intent, and his eyes softened it appeared Naruto's response absolved him of any possible blame. It might have been dumb to suspect an academy student to blow up his own home, but he had to take every situation into account, even the absurd ones. No, Naruto-kun, no one was hurt, of which I'm sure we're both glad for. Do you know anyone who might go this far? Anyone who might be able to get inside your house? He questioned. Naruto's face turned somber, and Hiruzen nearly regretted the question. Well, Considering how about 99% of the people in the village hate me, it's safe to say a lot of people. And technically, anyone could get in my house since I don't bother to lock it. I don't have anything valuable, so they can't really hurt me sentimentally. He responded. Closing his eyes and taking deep breaths to stave off his anger, the Sandame kneeled down to Naruto's level and put his hands on his shoulders. Oh Naruto-kun, I said it before and I'll say it again. I'm sorry for not seeing the obvious, for not being there for you, and for letting this whole mess get out of hand. I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive this old man for his mistakes. Tears were slowly leaking from the Sandame's eyes. Smiling softly, yet sadly, the lengths of his regret, Naruto put his hands on Hiruzen's. Gee San, it's okay, I already forgave you. I'm not really one to stay mad at anyone for long, and you were doing what you thought was right so I can't fault you for that. Now stop crying. The Hokage's supposed to be strong, right? Physically and emotionally, Naruto responded, smiling the whole time. Despite what he said, the Sandame actually cried more, this time in joy and relief, pulling the boy into a hug, surprising him for a bit before it was returned. Oh Naruto-kun, you're right, a Hokage should be strong, but a Hokage is also still human, 
and sometimes, one just needs a good cry to cleanse the soul. With a heart as big as yours, I should have known better, but thank you all the same for forgiving this old fool. Sarutobi thanked while wiping his tears. With that whole business out of the way, I came here for another reason. With your academy graduation exam tomorrow, I wanted to say that I fully expect you to graduate and become a shinobi of Konoha. If I want to give you my hat one day, you'll need to be one to take it, don't you think? He asked rhetorically, breaking into a chuckle which Naruto joined in. Definitely, J.I.I. San. I'm certain of my graduation, so you better be prepared to give me that hat one day. Naruto announced like he always did. Laughing heartily now, his heart lighter, Hiruzen merely nodded. Then hold up your end of the bargain, Naruto-kun, and graduate to become a shinobi the likes of haven't been seen since men of your father and our esteemed Shodime's stature and prowess. He responded, believing wholeheartedly that Naruto can reach such heights. Thanks for believing in my all the time, J.I.I.-san. I plan to make you proud, Naruto assured before running off, waving back at the Sandame. Waving back at the retreating boy, the Sandame returned to the investigation, intent on finding the person who attempted such a horrible thing, blinded by hate. With Naruto, like always, he ignored the glares and whispers, this time not being affected by them at all. Though he noticed he got a few looks from his new clothes, and he felt them concentrating on the kanji on his back when their eyes fell on them. He didn't care either way, and just made his way to Ichiraku's, a smile forming on his face when it came into view. Ducking through the banner, Naruto announced his presence. Ayame ne chan, Chuki ojii san. He hollered exuberantly. Naruto. Ayame responded questioningly, slightly confused putting the face and clothes together, but more relieved once she saw he was okay. Her eyes were red, possibly from crying once she heard news of his house going up in an explosion. Naru chan. She tackled the boy right over the counter, latching onto him and refusing to let go while crying anew. Crap, I guess she was worried because of my work with the old place. I should really think things through from now on. Ayame ne chan, it's okay, I'm fine. I'm guessing you heard about the business with my apartment. He asked, only to receive more sniffles and sobs. That's putting it lightly, kiddo, we were both heartbroken when we heard the news. But seeing as you're here, you weren't inside when it happened. Chuki spoke up on her behalf his constantly closed eyes giving nothing away, but the dried tear streams down his face betraying him. Yeah, apparently it happened while I was on my way to J.I.I. San for some business concerning. A new abode, when it happened. I was actually just talking to him about the whole thing and we both think someone snuck into my place. Idiotically, I always left it unlocked since I had nothing for anyone to break that I would really care about, and planted explosives. Thankfully, I have a new place, much more guarded, and I'll keep it locked. It's not like they can really get to it, anyway, given the security measures. He explained, before looking down at Ayame, who appeared to have calmed down. You good, Nei-chan? He asked softly. With a shaky nod, Ayame stood up with Naruto's help and retreated back behind the counter after giving him another hug. So, you have a new home. How do you manage that? She asked attempting to steer the conversation away from that whole mess since it was no longer a factor. It was, family business. I found some information pertaining to some living arrangements, and I came to collect. That makes me sound like some mob boss, doesn't it? Naruto asked in the end, receiving a pair of nods and amused smirks, before Chuki realized something. So you know, he asked grimly. Naruto blinked owlishly. You know, how, he asked simultaneously confirming it for Chuki and wondering how since it probably wasn't common knowledge. He hoped. Kid, I've been serving ramen here for over 30 years, and the only people who are able to eat me out of ingredients are you, Uzumaki Kashina, and the Yandaimi that one time when she just kept egging him on. He explained, smiling in amusement at remembering that day. Kashina basically dared Minato to a ramen eating contest. Of course, she won but the Yandaimi came to regret accepting, both financially and gastrointestinally, it must be an Uzumaki thing to put away that much ramen and not suffer the consequences. Well, beyond Naruto's stunted growth, taking only a beat to realize this, and process that image, Naruto chuckled. Well, I guess the cat's out of the bag, 
Yeah, I know about them, and I went to the Hokage for my inheritance. I got a letter from them, the house, a ton of money, and some jutsu for me to learn when I become a shinobi. I used the money to get these clothes, by the way. He mentioned. Yeah, I was going to ask about them. They look nice on you, Naru-chan. Less of an eyesore. Ayame teased. Surprisingly, instead of verbally lashing out, ranting on how orange is the greatest color ever, Naruto merely chuckled and rubbed his head. Yeah, I guess, since I intended to be a shinobi, I decided to go for more appropriate colors, but the orange will never die. There it was. Besides, if I can paint the most noticeable landmark in more orange and not get caught until I essentially let them find me, less will only help me, right? He reasoned, to which they eventually nodded, seeing the merit. Now, with that out of the way, I'm a hankering for some ramen. He announced while finally sitting on his preferred stool. So, what'll it be, then? Chuki asked with a chuckle while returning to the stove. I plan to celebrate my definite graduation tomorrow, so three each of miso, pork, and vegetable ramen. Naruto answered, lightly shuddering at that last order. Oh ho, someone's confident. But vegetable, you never touch the stuff, what changed? Ayame asked. Well, since I've finally decided to hunker down on basically everything, academics, training, and now my health, I plan on fixing some flaws with myself, included my height deficiency. Yes, let's call it that, it hurt his pride less. You mean you being short? Ayame immediately shot the chance of saving face down. Quote dot dot dot, yes. Naruto relented with waterfall tears. Coming right up, Chuki responded, getting to work. So what makes you so sure you'll graduate this time? Ayame asked since her services weren't required. I'm not exaggerating when I say I know everything I need to pass the exam. Naruto explained truthfully, really, the only thing that kept him from graduating the first time was the Bunshin no Jutsu. He had passed everything else by the skin of his teeth, and with his prowess now, he can perform the accursed technique that allowed Mizuki to take advantage of his emotional state and lead to a whole slew of shit. Well, if you say so. What changed, though? On Friday, you were freaking out, saying you were unprepared. Ayame asked. Curse you, human curiosity. I decided to get my business together and crammed as much as I could. I even asked Aruka-sensei for help. He responded smoothly. Oh that was nice of him, and smart of you. Ayame praised, with dedication like that, last minute or not, you'll definitely pass. She gave a thumbs up the likes of which guy would praise, complete with a ting. As that like, something I'm not getting. Cuz I've only seen guy and Lee do that. What does that mean for Ayame ne chan? Naruto gave her a suspicious look, though joking all the same. Thanks, Ayame ne chan. He responded. Naruto spent the next half hour just talking with Ayame and Chuki about mostly random topics, the blonde gorging himself, actually managing to stomach the vegetable ramen, he dared to say he even liked it. Ayame had to check if he was hallucinating, or that the sky was falling. Anyway, after that, Naruto bade farewell and just walked around the village with no real plans. I really hate lying to everyone, but it's not like I can come out and say I suddenly know every jutsu that was is, and will be because I'm from the future and three goddesses pulled me from the edge of death to fix the world. Yeah, that won't land me in the nuthouse at all. Naruto sighed and resigned himself to a future of lying to everyone just to cover his ass. But wait, how am I supposed to explain how I know a Konoha Kinjutsu? Exclamation mark. If I pass, Mizuki doesn't show up to trick me, and I don't get the forbidden scroll so I don't learn the cage bunshin. Oh Kami does that mean? I have to purposely fail. Naruto wanted to cry, he really did. There was literally no way for him to, wait. Oh wait, he started to run back home. Let me have this. Oh sweet Kami, just let me have this. He mentally begged as he hastily opened the gate and door, locking both behind him, and running towards the master bedroom. Reaching into the drawer he put his parents' letter in, Naruto unfolded it and looked towards the bottom. Yes. Oh thank you, yes. There it was. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Uzumaki have two large chakra reserves for the normal Bunshin as per Konoha's academy requirements, so the Nadaim taught our clan this technique to help us. With the Kayubi, 
it'll be even harder, so this will definitely help, Sochi. Love, mom. This time, Naruto did cry, both at the utter relief he felt, and this little bit of extra love his Ka-san left him. Ah, uh, Naru-kun, you do realize that with the goddesses, gifts, you even know the normal bunshin no jutsu, right? Kashin piped in, amused at this whole situation. Single quote dot dot dot. Kami. Dot ing, damn it. Naruto soared once he realized that. Without even a word, he formed the technique right next to himself, and reached over the bean it upside his head. And sure enough, his hand went right through it. He could hear Kashin laughing inside his head. Sighing in dejection at his completely pointless freak out, Naruto put the letter away again and sat on the bed, thinking things over since the whole, being from the future, thing kickstarted a whole heap of things he would have to hide until the appropriate time. But the point remains that I can't really be throwing around Rasengan and elemental jutsu right out of the academy. I guess I'll have to be subtle about things, and if anyone asks how I learned a technique seemingly overnight, I can just say I cheated with Cage Bunshin. Ugh, being subtle isn't really my thing, but I have no choice. Thankfully I don't have such limitations here at home, thanks to that Fuinjutsu barrier. Well, I don't have much else to do today but more. You know what, I'm just going to keep calling it training, even if it really isn't. More training, getting off his bed and heading for the backyard, immediately starting his physical training, before thinking of something. It took him four and a half hours to get completely exhausted, and that was from running and the various exercises. With a technique suddenly filling his head, he suspected Kashin's aid, he realized he could accomplish both at the same time using the Nadame Suchikage's Bunritsu no Jutsu, which was a physical division of himself. Silently, Naruto grunted as his entire being was halved and split down the middle, the literal clone ending up standing beside him. With this technique, his power was halved, so both of them might have half as much stamina. That put them at 2 hours and 15 minutes before exhaustion. With half hour breaks, they could work well into the night, ending with three simultaneous sessions of physical training, resulting in 13 and a half hours. Let's get to work, Naruto once said, receiving a nod from his duplicate. Eight hours and fifteen minutes later, 11.15 at night and dragging themselves to the master bedroom, both Naruto's weren't exactly looking forward to the culmination of their stacked exhaustion, he would most assuredly pass out. With the designated first Naruto laying down, the second touched his shoulder and they began to fuse back together. Like a freight train to the skull, Naruto was knocked right out from the doubled exhaustion, Kashin merely shaking her head in amusement at the lengths he was going to, to fix himself. The next morning, awakening with a groan, Naruto slightly regretted his idea yesterday. Can't argue with the results, though. I got more training in less time, if I stuck with just myself with four and a half hours, throwing in one break. I'd accomplish 9 hours of training and it would actually be later than I finished last night, I'd say it was worth it. At that thought, Naruto turned to the clock. 7 a.m. Cool, he had an hour to do everything before heading to the academy. With that in mind, he did his morning ritual of hygiene, clothes, and breakfast. As Naruto ate his cereal, he allowed his mind to wander. I'm just now realizing the gravity of this opportunity. I can fix what was broken create bridges where there were only canyons. I can really help people. First, I need to find some way to expose Mizuki again, though, since he won't come to me for that, secret test. And maybe I can steer Sasuke away from the path he was taking. But how, despite me going after him? I guess a couple months from now, man, time travel hurts my head, I don't really know that much about him to really be his friend. I don't really know what he likes, and he seems to dislike everything. We don't really interact outside of missions, and he can't seem to stand me, anyway. Man, I have my work cut out for me. Then there's also Sakura ch. Dot dot, Sakura, I guess nearly dying really opened my eyes, she never loved me, and never would. She only had eyes for Sasuke. But there was someone who seemed to genuinely care for me, someone who supported me through and through. Hayuga Hanada, a shy girl, she didn't really seem the sort to have anything bad to say about anyone, but she held a special type of affection towards him. She radiated joy at his mere presence, and she even adopted his nindo. 
That last bit got a grateful smile and a chuckle out of him. While he didn't know his own feelings towards the girl, he would open up to her and see where it went. Who knows? They might be just what each other needs. Some bombastic to boost her confidence, and someone calm and collected to tone him down. Yeah, that'd be nice. Blushing lightly when he noticed the time, finding he spent nearly 40 minutes thinking about the merits of extending a hand of friendship to Hinata, and maybe more, Naruto bolted up, having a clone do the dishes, while heading out to the academy, his pace becoming sedate the closer he got, a small smile on his face at the thought of everyone's reactions to his new look and the fact that, Dobi, would pass. That last remark brought a frown to his face, though. Dobi, how he hated that word. Sasuke called him that all the time, and so did everyone else, essentially. Not her. Naruto shook his head with a blush at that thought. To be honest, he was really only half at fault for receiving the title. If the teachers didn't want to teach, then how can the student be expected to desire to learn? When he was faced with several instructors either denying him the proper education, or feeding him false information, he just, stopped wanting to learn. So he turned to pranks. His scores dropped, they weren't really that high in the beginning, anyway, and he got the name stuck. Dobie, these people were blinded by grief and hatred. The thing he was sent back to fix. He couldn't really go door to door and help people overcome these emotions. For one thing, he didn't know how to do that, so he'd have to find some way for him to affect the vast majority positively. Gah, he slapped his cheeks lightly. This is too heavy for me to be thinking about so soon. I'll cross that bridge when I get to it, he decided, just as he approached the academy. He let the AC wash over him as he walked inside and made his way to the classroom, finding he was here relatively early. The only ones here were Sasuke, Shikamaru, oddly enough, and Hanada. Though she was looking the other way now that he was looking at her, Naruto knew she was looking at him when he walked in. Maybe even before, thanks to her by Akugan. Making a decision, Naruto walked past his normal seat beside Sasuke, and approached Hanada's row, the Hyuga heiress shaking growing as he grew closer. She looks, kinda cute with her hands close to her face like that. Naruto observed before mentally slapping himself to get a hold of his hormones. Moving on from that, Naruto approached her row. Is anyone else sitting here? He asked, not quite remembering if every seat was filled. Of course, his graduating class wasn't just the rookie nine, there were some civilians and children of shinobi he didn't quite remember that made up teams one to six, after all. And no, no one sits here, was all Hanada could respond with her face slowly turning red from Naruto's presence, especially when he nodded and sat down. Right next to her, and smiled at her with that grin she was very familiar with, even if he didn't know she was. Thanks, Hanada-chan, Naruto said once he sat down, merely using the suffix as he would for any girl, at least that's what he kept telling himself. He tried not to stare at her when she blushed harder and brought her hands closer to her face, she just looked really adorable. Intending to take his mind off that, he struck up a conversation. So, you nervous about the exam? He asked. A a little bit. H how about you, Naruto-kun? She asked with that stutter Naruto suddenly found cute. What is happening to me? Where is this coming from? No way, I'm totally gonna pass. I'm sure you will, too, so maybe we'll be on a team together. Naruto praised though mentally frowned since he already knew what was going to happen. He said it just to get her to smile. And what a smile it was. It was the kind of smile that made Naruto feel true warmth inside. Th thank you, Naruto-kun. I believe why you'll pass, too, and it would be n nice for us to be on the same team. Hanada responded, rephrasing what she truly wanted to say, that she wanted them to be on the same team. And so they spent the next 10 minutes just chatting together quietly, Hinata slowly coming out of her shell, but she couldn't get rid of that stutter, which Naruto didn't wholeheartedly mind, but he of course wouldn't promote the stutter, as it was a clear sign she lacked confidence, and he wanted to help with that. When the shouts of Sakura and Ino reached their ears, Naruto noticed Hinata's crestfallen look, perhaps she expected him to abandon her at the approach of his, Sakura-chan. Well no more. When she noticed he stayed with her and continued chatting, she gave a smile that brought back that warm feeling. 
He wanted to see that smile more often. Of course, everyone else noticed that Naruto ignored Sakura and was sitting and talking with Hinata. Many of them that didn't particularly hate Naruto thought it was about damn time. The rest just simply stared in shock. Naruto didn't care about them. Right now, all that mattered was himself and his friend. Yeah, his friend. A real one. Nearly 8 o'clock on the dot, Uruka and Mizuki walked in with a small chest, which Naruto remembered held the various hit I ate for graduates. As you all know, today is the day of your academy graduation exam. It will consist of three sections. A written test, Bukijutsu, testing your accuracy with kunai and shuriken on stationary and moving targets, and the three academy ninjutsu. Mizuki will pass out the tests, there will be no cheating. Do your best, Uruka explained, his silver-haired partner passing the tests around. When Naruto received his test, he felt a layer of chakra on it, and noticed Mizuki's tight expression, as if he was holding in the great sneer he so desperately wanted to show. Dispelling the genjutsu with ease, Naruto blazed through the test, using the same tactics many genin during the chunin exams did, while answering any pertaining to the ones he answered the first time or famous jutsu himself. Yes he was cheating, hey, if he didn't get caught, then Aruka wouldn't know he cheated. Plus, they were shinobi, the occupation called for doing things far worse than cheating on a questionnaire. With the test done, he flipped it over and waited for everyone else to finish, finding he was in the middle range of students that finished. The Chunin instructors noticed and were slightly shocked, Mizuki secretly infuriated also. As such, he took to subtly glaring at Naruto, looking straight into his eyes. What he found shocked him to his core. Death, his death. Before his eyes, Mizuki saw himself dying over and over again, at Naruto's hand. If he wanted a demon, he got one. The traitorous Chunin excused himself from the room, running once he closed the door to empty the contents of his stomach in the nearest trash can. Once the dry heaving stopped, he propped himself against the nearby wall, panting in fear as sweat dripped down his face. What? Was that? I knew he was a demon, but that, that was unreal. Does he know? Mizuki discarded that thought. It was impossible for the demon to know what he intended, to exploit his emotional state when he failed to both serve his master and become a hero. Once he got himself under control, he returned to the classroom, apologizing to Aruka and making some excuse about paperwork he thought he misplaced. A few minutes after that, everyone finished and Aruka collected the tests. They were moved outside to begin the Bukijutsu portion, and they were called up by name, though Naruto was called after Ino, as Aruka knew he preferred it, to save the best for last. But this time, it would be true. Like last time, Sasuke got 91.6%, perfect in kanai, and a 5 out of 6 in shuriken, they were given 6 kanai and 6 shuriken, 3 each for moving and stationary targets. He saw the Uchiha survivor was conflicted, he absorbed the praise arrogantly, but he was annoyed that he didn't do perfect on the shuriken section. Probably because Itachi got 100% or something. It'll make more sense once Naruto got a perfect score. When the blonde was called up, he strode forward indifferently, but the more observant, the Chunin and Hinata, whose eyes never left him, found he held a certain confidence, which infuriated Mizuki again, and drew Hinata's awe. Taking the offered kunai and shuriken sets, Naruto wanted so much to show off, outdoing Sasuke by leagues, while simultaneously insulting him by using his brother's own technique, the Uchiha Tawani no Jutsu Uchiha deflection technique, to change the trajectory of the projectiles for his perfect run, but he felt that would put up all sorts of red flags around him and turn certain eyes on him that he didn't want. So, fighting down the prankster, show off in him, he went for a more subdued route, aiming for a perfect score nonetheless. For at least a little bit of an insult, he would achieve this left-handed, when everyone knew he was right-handed. Switching the kunai to his left hand, he felt everyone's indignation, and even heard a few whispers about self-sabotage, but he ignored them all. With a flick of the wrist, it flew. Bullseye. Granted, it was one of the stationary targets, so everyone thought he just got a lucky break. No way he could do it a second. Thunk. There. Thunk. Dot dot. Not with shuriken. They were lighter, and required a sort of curve in the throw for proper. Thunk. 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 Okay. He was out of stationary targets. No way he could do it. 
Naruto made a show of flipping one of his remaining kunai lazily. Catching it by the ring, he quickly threw it, followed by last two, and followed with two of the shuriken, leaving the last for a special treat. Already, everyone was staring at him as if he were some alien thing, save for Hinata who only had adoration. This was where Sasuke tripped up. So, he made direct eye contact with the Uchiha with a stone face, which his rival reciprocated, though there was plenty indignation and panic in his eyes. Without looking, Naruto let loose. Thunk, you unbelievable, Naruto, you scored 100, Baruka announced, to shocked silence. And no way, he had to have cheated. Yeah, there's no way Naruto Baka did better than Sasuke kun without cheating. Baruka sensei, this can't be fair. Oh shut up. Naruto exploded before Aruka could attempt to calm everyone down, getting their attention, shocking them into silence again. He had been holding this in since his mind became clearer from the goddesses, gifts and he made several observations of the flaws in the academy. There were too many for his liking, in the curriculum, and its students. We're shinobi, we lie, we cheat, we steal, we kill. It's in the job description, so stop acting like we have honor. Leave that for the samurai. Besides, I didn't even cheat by your standards. Anyway, this is the real me. At least now, I didn't show this ability from the get go because I couldn't care less about titles. Dobi, rookie of the year, these titles mean nothing in the real world. The Yandaimi, dead last, Orochimaru, rookie of the year, look how they turned out. See how these titles mean nothing. More importantly, your opinions of my ability mean nothing. Until some of you shape up, you are nothing. It was harsh, but necessary. Naruto, that's going too. You should be the one saying this, Uruka sensei. Naruto snapped at Uruka, silencing him in shock. Isn't your job to prepare us for a shinobi career? How does history and theory help when our enemy can just waltz right up behind us and tear out throats open? The curriculum is a joke. I know it was changed because we aren't in war times, but didn't the Nadimes say times of peace are only the spaces between times of war? Sometimes the old ways are better. That way less of. These. He gestured towards Sasuke's gaggle of fangirls, causing them to flinch in shock. Pass and more competent shinobi can aid Konoha instead of just becoming nameless corpses far from home, or worse. Naruto was on a tirade and he was tearing some ass. And it was all true. His piece done, and panting from the rage he let loose, Naruto returned to his spot beside Hinata, who only looked at him with some akin to idolization. It was, cute and creepy at the same time. Is that possible? It was now. W well. It pains me to say this, but he's right. Baruka finally said, drawing indignant looks from his students, while making a point to Naruto that he was pained to admit the cold truth, not to admit Naruto was right with his eyes, to which Naruto subtly nodded. The shinobi world is cold and cruel. Despite what many of you think, we are not knights in shining armor, we are not heroes, we are not even really the good guys. In a way, shinobi are just glorified mercenaries for hire. If the client can afford it, our missions can be to protect the merchant trader to open routes for the village to prosper, to kill the merchant trader to cut off the enemy village's resources. We can be ordered to protect a settlement, or lay siege on a small village, killing anyone and everyone. Men, women, and children. At that, almost all his students looked horrified. And we really can't say no. If we do, it could mean a hit to our economy, losing clients for future missions, or people die. Everything we do is dictated by our pay. And despite his temperament, Naruto was right about one other thing. The academy curriculum is poor a shadow of what it once was, the type of curriculum that produced splendid shinobi from the get-go, and also. A lot of you aren't ready. His students gasped in shock. From what I've seen, through some miracle, only seven of you are truly ready for the life of a shinobi, though it might seem unfair since several of them are from powerful shinobi backgrounds, that only qualifies half their potential, the other being what they do with it. That being said, I'll be passing you based partially on your scores, but mostly on whether you are truly ready or not. While the academy is here to be a basis for your future, most of you have become reliant on it, and I foresee you don't intend to change, or may take too long to change. He decided, seeing many of them were about to turn on Naruto in accusation, 
he interfered to set the record straight and spare them from a furious-looking Naruto who probably intended to explode on them again. Now listen here, none of you blame Naruto for telling the truth. I'm sure he's doing this for your benefit as well. He said, turning to the blonde for confirmation, sighing in relief when he received a nod and, surprisingly, a warm smile towards his students, taking them aback. Wholeheartedly, I don't do this because I hate you, or think less of you, but because I see what you can become. Splendid, brilliant, absolutely beautiful, you can be so much more than you are. I won't say you'll be the next Yandaimi or even Shodaim, because you won't. They deflated and looked to yell again, he stopped them short of that. You can be more, you can be better, you know the old saying, don't be the next someone else. Be the first you, I've taken the first steps to better myself, as you've clearly seen. Dot dot quote, he gestured towards the shuriken and Kanai. Quote dot dot, dot and you can all do the same. What I've accomplished, you can do the same, you can improve upon. And whether you take my words to heart, I don't care. I'll take your hate head on and only return love. I do this for Konoha and her children. And if Aruka goes through with what he says, then a lot of you who were sure you would pass might not, and I'm sorry if that angers you, but this allows you to better yourselves. I truly believe you can accomplish this. Naruto finished his speech, cooling himself down from his tirade, successfully diffusing their anger into cool acceptance, if weighed by varying levels of annoyance. Just thinking of something, Naruto quickly added. And remember, there are no shortcuts, no matter what anyone else says. He was looking right at Mizuki when he said this, taking joy in his curious expression when the Kyubi brat appeared one step ahead of him. His pretty little speech didn't convince him one bit, honeyed words covering deadly venom. Mizuki had intended to approach one of the possibly many failing students with a promise of a free pass if they brought him the Forbidden Scroll of Seals, but now that plan was shot down before it could even launch. Well said, Naruto, Uruka complimented, absolutely beaming in pride at his students' words of wisdom, harsh as they were. Naruto's words were the kick in the ass he, and possibly everyone, needed. He would make sure to approach the Sandame about the blonde's words and possibly petition for the old, better curriculum, so these half-ed shinobi and fangirl kunoichi could quickly become a thing of the past. He also intended to approach Naruto about his words, questioning where this all came from as it seemed out of the blue. Many of the students nodded in solemn acceptance as they realized the gravity of their situations, but ultimately didn't blame Naruto, even the children of Naruto haters. Naruto just got a massive boost in his peers' opinions of him. Oh, and poor Hinata was practically drooling at how amazing he was, and the things he said. She just might faint. Realizing his friend's current state, Naruto chose it as the perfect moment to take that first step. Hey Hinata-chan, wanna join me for lunch after the exam, whether either of us graduate or not? He asked. She fainted. Ah, Hinata, Naruto yelped, appearing beside her and doting on the poor girl, drawing several chuckles from his classmates. Despite the person that just opened their eyes Naruto seemingly became, he was still Naruto. Thirty minutes later, Uruka moved the class back into the classroom for the ninjutsu section, Naruto having successfully awoken Hinata, with Kiba's help, since she passed right back out when his face was the first thing she woke up to. The heiress sat in her seat, seemingly permanently crimson with her embarrassment, Naruto smiling at her silliness, while blushing lightly as the image of her peaceful face asleep was stuck in his head. Okay, so next is the ninjutsu portion, when your name is called, come into the next room and you'll be asked to perform the henge, kawari me, and bunshin no jutsu. You will be graded on your mastery of them, ascertained by the amount of time you take to actually perform it and difficulty we observe you have. Now, despite my current plans, don't give up hope and not try you may still pass if you perform well in this section. Uruka attempted to assure them, with varying success, some students looked hopeful, others know so much. Just realized something, did I totally mess up the timeline with what I said? Uruka sensei said seven of us are definitely passing, there's nowhere near the nine teams there were last time. It's also not enough for complete teams, so there's going to be someone left over. Is it possible I just created a whole new mess for myself? Fook, Naruto lamented. It was bound to happen, anyway. Even if you didn't say anything, 
something different would have happened. It was inevitable, Kashin commented, attempting to assuage him. What do you mean, Kashin Chan? Naruto asked, curious and confused. Outright time travel isn't real. What the goddesses actually did was send you to a different reality with minor differences so you can acclimate yourself properly, with several points along the timeline in flux, which is where the differences are. The graduation exam and thus team selections and members would have been different whether you said something or not. And don't bother asking me what other points are in flux, as that would be giving you foreknowledge, and that can be dangerous. I wouldn't know the specifics, anyway, just when they happen, not what, choices, there are. Kashin explained, her tone serious. Single quote dot dot dot. Yujish, time travel hurts my head. Naruto mentally groaned. I told you, it's not time travel, it's. You know what I mean. This got a lot more complicated than it really needed to be. Naruto interrupted. Oh, you wanna talk complicated? Don't get me started on paradoxes. Kashin responded, equal parts joking and exasperation in her tone. Single quote dot dot dot. Whatever that is, I don't want to know. Bootstrap. What? Never mind. I still don't wanna know. Yudo. Uzumaki Naruto. Uruka calling him up snapped him out of that conversation, causing him to sheepishly rise and follow Uruka into the next room, sadly finding a lot of headband less students, though none of them really glared at him, save for some of Sasuke's fangirls, but not all, so that was a plus. Sorry Uruka sensei, I was thinking about something pretty hard. Naruto lied, apologized. I would imagine so, after that speech. Think next time you could. Tone down the veiled insults, though. You really hurt those girls when you talked about their obsession that way. Uruka chastised lightly while they were in the hallway between rooms, the doors thankfully keeping their conversation muffled no matter how much one tried to listen in. Frowning, Naruto was equal parts guilty and headstrong in his words. I never meant to hurt anyone, but my thoughts still stand. Their infatuation and mannerisms such as dieting will get them, and their comrades, killed, so they need to shape up. He responded passionately. Sighing, Uruka had to agree. I suppose so, but you could have been nicer. They're really only partially to blame, as you pointed out about our curriculum. He said. Quote dot dot dot. True, you gonna go to JII San about that? Naruto asked. I really wished you'd show the Hokage more respect, but I know it won't stop. Uruka responded exasperatedly, to Naruto's amusement. But yes, I plan to bring this to Hokage-sama. Perhaps we can reach a compromise, a bit of the old and a bit of the new. Uruka thought. That all depends on him. Now let's do this, I want my hit I ate. Naruto responded confidently. I sure hope you worked on your clone technique. Uruka wished as he opened the door to the room, Mizuki mysteriously absent. We'll see, was all Naruto said, though his smirk spoke volumes. Well you know the drill, henge first. Uruka asked of him, clipboard in hand. Wordlessly, motionlessly, Naruto disappeared in a puff of smoke, the sandame taking his place, complete with his beloved pipe, and a small orange book he seemed extremely enraptured in. Hee <laughs> hee, oh, Amy Chan, how interesting. With a light blush and tick mark, Uruka beamed the transformed Naruto in the head, momentarily forgetting he did the technique sealessly and without vocally invoking it, only to find it was deflected by the corporeal hat, causing his embarrassment and annoyance to disappear, replaced with shock. W-H wa, H how? He stuttered. The normal transformation was an illusion, the change is only on a cosmetic level. Oh, ah uh, yeah, my henge is kind of special. Naruto explained lamely after changing back. His transformation technique was like this before this whole mess with the goddesses happened. Quote dot dot dot, I'll be sure to bring this up with the Hokage, as well. Naruto, you might have created a new jutsu altogether. Uruka commented, steadily getting over his shock. Really? Cool. Naruto responded with a wide grin. Chuckling at his response, Uruka checked off Henge with a quick note on the side. Next, kawari me with this chair. Uruka ordered lightly. The next second, Naruto was standing beside him, looking over his shoulder at the clipboard. You should probably add, Naruto is awesome. Somewhere on that, he commented conspiratorially. 
Baruka jumped in alarm at the quickness with which he performed the technique, also sealessly and silently. Get back there, he demanded, pointing to the chair. Shrugging nonchalantly, Naruto switched with the chair again. Now three bunshin, Baruka said, silently wishing Naruto the best. In three puffs of smoke, the required clones appeared behind Naruto, standing stoically. Baruka visibly sagged in relief when they weren't sickly or appeared on the verge of dying. Checking that off, he put the clipboard down and gestured towards the hit I ate before it. Wonderful Naruto, you pass. Now all that's left is for you to pick which headband you want, and you're officially a genin of Konoha. Baruka congratulated and advised, though he planned to bring up Naruto's seemingly perfect mastery of the jutsu to the sandame. Thanks Uruka sensei though that, officially a genin thing isn't really true. Damn you, Kakashi sensei. Mentally shrugging his shoulders, Naruto moved forward and picked up the hit I ate with the black cloth and wrapped it around his forehead, keeping his growing bangs at bay from his eyesight. Naruto returned to the room, headband on display, and was immediately assaulted with, congratulations. Hey, way to go Naruto. I should have known you'd pass, good job. Guess all your training and determination paid off, huh? It was enough to nearly make him cry. By reaching out to people with kindness, they returned it, and Naruto was accepted. He thanked them, and repeated his words from earlier, that they could pass next year, and be even better than they perceived him to be. With that, he returned to his seat beside Hinata, returning her radiant smile that she graduated as well. As far as he could see, Team 8 as a whole graduated, and teams 7 and 10 minus their Kunoichi graduated, so Sakura and Ino didn't graduate. Perhaps it was for the best. While Ino was slightly better than Sakura, the Chunin exam preliminaries showed that wasn't by much. So that meant one team would need to be filled in, and another would have an extra member, unless JII San allowed an apprenticeship. Possible but doubtful. Baruka returned to the room and gave his speech. Congratulations to those of you who graduated and apologies to the great amount of you that didn't, but as we learned today, this allows you another year to become even better than you thought possible. I will seek out a method to better the curriculum, so I can further facilitate your progress. To those who graduated, you now carry the future of Konoha's strength. I hope you each become the embodiment of our will of fire, burning brightly for your comrades to be beside you, and generations to come. Return tomorrow morning for team assignments. The bell rung for school dismissal. Those who didn't graduate, return in three months' time for the next school year. He added before they ran out to their parents, though he was not looking forward to the complaints from several parents about such a large number of children not passing, and a certain someone that did pass. Naruto himself was also not looking forward to the eventual enhanced glares he got when they saw he passed, but he hoped his classmates didn't out him as the reason so many didn't. Unfortunately, that turned out to be the case, but possibly for the better, as several adults that once had fierce glares at the sight of him passing listened to their children explain in detail the flaws he pointed out, both in the academy and them, and several looked at him inquisitively, with no hint of malice. It wasn't all of them, but more than half, and that was a good start. Then he remembered something. Oh, Hanada-chan, you still wanna go have some lunch to celebrate? He asked, since he never really got in a swir. And he still didn't get an answer. Because she fainted again. Ah, Hanada. It had only been two hours since Aruka announced the graduates for the academy, and he had come to tell the Sandame the news. He wasn't exactly happy. Quote dot dot dot. I'm afraid I didn't hear you, Aruka kun Could you repeat that? The Sandame asked of the Chunin instructor with great patience and a stern face. Aruka gulped in slight fear of his commanding officer but relayed the results of the graduation exam nonetheless. Oh only seven children graduated, Sandame Sama. Th the rest weren't ready. He repeated with hesitance. And what do you mean? They weren't ready. How did you come to this conclusion? Hiruzen asked slowly. Here, Uruka sighed. Naruto opened my eyes, Hokage Sama. After he aced the Bukijutsu section, he made an effort to point that out, to Serutobi's joy. Dot the students accused him of cheating because he beat Uchiha Sasuke. That appeared to be the breaking point for him, and he snapped. Here, Hiruzen grew worried, it was never good for a Jinchuriki to snap, especially one he considered a grandson. Thankfully, 
that wasn't the case. Instead of explaining it, I managed to acquire the video from one of our outside security cameras, it captured his speech. He retrieved a cassette from his pocket and gave it to the Sandame. The Hokage took it and inserted it into the player in his desk, a projector descending from the ceiling and playing what the camera captured, Hiruzen watching with rapt attention when it concerned his grandson figure. He watched Naruto explain the moral gray area that was the Shinobi way, that their misconceptions about right and wrong should be left with the samurai, that they would be expected to do horrible things for their village. Then he mentioned this was the true depths of his skill, that titles like Dobi and Rookie of the Year were meaningless in the real world. His examples brought a smile to his face, before it fell to a pained frown. Then things turned a bit darker when Naruto gave them an ultimatum, shape up, or die out in the field, forgotten, and in the cases of the Kunoichi, a fate worse than death. Then he called Aruka out on the fact this speech should be handled by him, by all teachers, and that the curriculum was a mess, changed from his sensei's harsh training to a more laid-back regimen for these peace times. Naruto quoted Toborama sensei, and Hiruzen unfortunately saw merit in his words. These peace times wouldn't last, and the shinobi of the next generation should be prepared. The disturbing amount of what were most definitely fangirls, the scourge of his career when he was announced as student to both Hokage and heir to the Serutobi clan, didn't lift Naruto's mood, either. Then Uruka jumped in, explaining the things they would be asked to do, and making the observation, which Hiruzen could now see was accurate, it was plain to see on many of their faces, that a lot of them weren't ready. Then things became wonderful, Naruto, once asked, said he did it for their good, that he wanted them to succeed, to become something great, each one of them. That they could be amazing, if they really tried. When the video finished, Hiruzen took a moment to collect his thoughts, a content smile on his face. Oh Naruto-kun, you truly represent the will of fire. He made a decision, Uruka-kun, while he pains me to say this, your observation was valid, and I'll accept these results. We'll have to completely rework teams, though, so I may need your help with that. He said, receiving a nod. And I'll talk with the academy head about changing the curriculum. He assured. Uh, won't you have to talk it over with the council, Hokage-sama? You did for changing it in the first place. Uruka asked, confused. His answer was a fist slamming in a desk, causing him to jump. To hell with the council. They'd see if the curriculum never change. And we both know they wouldn't budge if I mentioned Naruto-kun by name. It was a sad truth. Plus, if I actually went through the trouble of putting it to a vote, they'd badger on about it being unnecessary. The civilian half know nothing of shinobi troubles, so they would see it as pointless, and my own teammates have grown complacent, and sadly so have I. I am Hokage, and this is a dictatorship first and foremost, they are advisors, and I take their words as a luxury, not a necessity. The kami no shinobi was back, and he was on the rampage. And Aruka couldn't be happier. Oh wait. Hokage-sama, there are some interesting things that happened with Naruto, as well. Uruka mentioned before he forgot. Hmm, and what would that be? Hiruzen asked. You know Naruto has always hated tests, as that was his weakest subject. Well, he finished it much earlier than usual. And he was one of the top scores. That raised a brow on the Sandame's aged face. And I already mentioned his perfect score on the Bukijutsu, he didn't show any improvement over the last week and the ninjutsu section, Hokage-sama, he performed all three sealessly, and without saying them. Uruka dropped the bomb. Hiruzen's eyes narrowed in thought. Only masters of the technique can invoke a jutsu without seals, and he had personally never encountered someone who could invoke a technique without saying it. Though, now that he thought about it, saying the technique's name was technically pointless. It didn't finalize the chakra molding or anything like that and it didn't continue it like seals, so it really wasn't needed. It was more of a luxury. Perhaps this is his true strength he mentioned, Uruka-kun. He could have trained his control in secret until he mastered them to that level. And not saying the technique isn't that big a deal. It doesn't really affect the technique like seals. It's more like reflex, if you want to think about it like that. We do it simply because that's how it's always been. He could have been hiding all this because, Let's face it, if the villagers caught wind of the demon child, showing high proficiency in the shinobi arts, they'd do everything in their power to interfere with that. 
Hiruzen reasoned, as sad as it was, assuaging the Chunin in a sort of morbid way, he felt this surprise would only be the first in a long line of them under the title, Uzumaki Naruto. Now, let's work on those team assignments, he said, receiving an appreciatory nod. With Naruto and Hinata, once Naruto got Hinata to wake up and give him an answer, they finally made their way to Amaguriyama, of all places. It was Hinata's go-to place whenever she went out for a snack, she explained it is, her Ichirakus. That got a chuckle out of Naruto. Apparently she was obsessed with this place. Once they got something to eat. Naruto red bean soup, Hinata cinnamon buns, he attempted to strike up a conversation with her, and made the mistake of looking at her as she ate her precious sweets. He never thought it would hurt to see something adorable. But now he did. He felt his heart clench something fierce when he spied her chewing on a bun like a little hamster. He immediately seared the image to his brain using the Sharingan portion of his Hakumigan and its visual copying ability. S. So, Hanada chan who do you think you'll be paired up with? It was much easier to talk to her while not looking at her. Hanada made some sort of inquisitive noise and looked at him while still eating, and he tried desperately to not make eye contact. It was nearly criminal how adorable she was right now. She stopped eating to give her thoughts. Uh, well, usually Hyuga are filed into teams specializing in either tracking or frontline assault, depending on the individual. Given myself, I believe I'll be put into a tracking team, and thus my teammates will be along the same vein. So that would put me with Kiba and Shino-san. She answered, with slight sadness since that meant she wouldn't be with Naruto-kun. The blonde was surprised at the lack of stuttering on her part, but it was for the better. What about you, Naruto-kun? She asked. Finally registering the question, Naruto's face screwed up in concentration, causing Hinata to subtly giggle at it. She found it cute. Well, despite my scores on the exam, I'm still dead last, so that would put me with the rookie and Kunoichi of the year, which would be Sasuke and, technically, Sakura but since she didn't graduate, that leaves that spot open. I guess they'd go for the, runner-up, of her position, and that's you, Hinata-chan. He explained, finally looking at her when he deemed it safe for his heart. Hinata was incredibly elated when she noticed the lack of an affectionate honorific when he mentioned Sakura, and the thought that she might actually be on a team with him because of the whole debacle he raised. While Hinata was never one to say anything bad about anyone, she didn't particularly care for the rosette, since she repeatedly denied Naruto-kun's affections, violently. Granted, his answer did raise up the point of fixing teams since there were only seven graduates. That left one odd man out. It also meant this generation's Inoshika Cho team wouldn't come to fruition. She pitied Uruka sensei since he would have to explain it to Inoichi-san why his, princess, didn't graduate this year. Hopefully Ino got her personality from her mother, and that Inoichi was more level-headed. With that, the new graduates ate in a comfortable silence, light smiles on their faces until they finished, Nerut paying for both of them and the children going their separate ways, Hanada to her clan compound to tell her father of the news, and Naruto to, nowhere, really. All the other kids went home for the reason Hanada was now, he didn't really know anyone outside of the academy and almost the entire village despised him, so, training. Guess so. Thirty minutes later, taking what amounted to a jaunty pace to get him, Naruto immediately went to his backyard, created a fission clone to start on the physical exercises. He also created a normal solid clone to have it get him familiarized with his various jutsu. With the multiple sessions and breaks, Naruto would stop at 10 o'clock tonight, otherwise he'd roll over into the morning after. But even with that, he'd still get 18 hours of training in nine and a half. This fission technique was nearly as broken as the Rinnegan, but like the Dujutsu, he didn't care, so it was with a wide grin that the Naruto, twins, set about their physical training. While they did that, the cage bunch and Naruto set about getting used to the various Jutsu the original knew. While only a quarter of the original strength and chakra capacity, that was still more than most Junin so it should be fine with feeling out these Judas, especially with the perfect control he had. With that, the clone started on fire release techniques, as this was Hai no Kuni. With that decision, the clone's mind exploded with an encyclopedic knowledge of all the fire techniques, he just needed to pick and choose. Over the course of the first session of two hours, 
15 minutes, the clone fired off fire technique after fire technique, finding that most of them centered around normal fireballs of various sizes, or dragons, with a few notable exceptions such as blades, ash of all things, or just giant walls of flaming death. Thankfully, the clone launched them all skyward so as not to impede the two Naruto's progress or set fire to the field. Not even feeling a drain on its reserves, the clone moved right into wind release as they took their first break. Fudan techniques mostly centered around blades, bullets, walls of crushing force, balls of, technically, the lack of wind, and the occasional small-scale natural disaster. There was even a dragon one, the clone began to detect a pattern. Anyway, well into the second session for the physical training clones, well, technically they're both the real Naruto. Fission techniques are confusing, the clone moved on to lightning. Almost immediately, the clone happened upon Ba Chan's ranch and show, a technique it would require one of the clones, or some other live guinea pig, to test on, the clone was forced to move on. The clone happened upon Sasuke Tem's prized technique he skewered the original with, twice, the Chidori. Oh ho ho, happy days. After manifesting the technique, the clone moved on to shape manipulation variants, such as blades, sunban, chakra flow through a spare kunai, currents along the ground, you name it. Then of course came Kakashi Sensei's stronger version, Reikiri, and its, albeit smaller, variants. Aren't these techniques technically foreknowledge of some kind? They'd be jutsu Sasuke would use, and the clone felt he would in less than friendly circumstances. Apparently not, since Cash and Chan wasn't saying anything. Anything. Oh you're cute. Anyway, the clone moved on to techniques it knew, from reading on his books from school, belonged to the current and previous rakage. Both named A. Was that some form of tradition? It's weird. Anyway, the Rariato and Jigokuzuki variants proved deadly, those trees never saw it coming. And the Raiden Chikura Moto was insane with the speed it afforded the clone, thankfully it also enhanced its reflexes so it didn't slam into any, dispelling itself and possibly interfering with the physically working clones. Then came the spears, blades, normal bolts, Heia clone technique, dragon, and even defensive walls and domes. Finding the other two were already midway through the third session, the clone decided to pick up the pace with Earth release. Boulders, more than one variant of dragon, the Suchikage's floating technique, various armors, spikes, walls, uses of mud, projectiles, a couple golems, some supplementary subterranean techniques, a couple weapons, a clone technique, and oh my kami, a wake a mole technique. Today was a good day. Moving on to water release, the clone happened upon stuff he remembered Zabuza from Nami using, neat. More dragons, whirlpools, tidal waves, sharks, like that fish guy with Itachi and Tanzaku guy, even some medical water techniques, as well as bullets and bubbles. By the time the clone finished with the last water technique, it just noticed the sun was well and gone, the moon high in the sky, and the original Naruto and his clone heading inside. Dispelling itself. Since it technically didn't learn anything new, it was more like re-learning, and giving the original a feel for the five elements, the two Naruto's headed inside and went through the same motions as last night, knocking the boy right out when they fused back together. The next morning, Shinobi Academy. Having gone through his morning ritual and breakfast with no real excitement, Naruto left a clone to continue last night's work of familiarizing himself with the sub-elements, now, and personally met up with Hanata outside the academy and they walked inside together, sitting at the same seats as yesterday, never breaking stride with their conversation. Naruto mentally noted how empty the room felt with only seven people in it. Not talking about anything of particular import, Naruto and Hinata were interrupted when Aruka came in, the former with what was possibly the now shortened list of new teams. Good morning, everyone, I trust my speech from yesterday is still fresh in your minds. A tick mark formed when he received less than positive responses, more than half the class giving him so-so gestures. Anyway, with that, I'll move straight into the teams. Team 1 will now consist of Akamichi Choji, Nara Shikamaru, and Abarame Shino. Your Junin Sensei will be Serutobi Asuma. And Team 2 will be Hayuga Hanada, Inazuka Kiba, and Uzumaki Naruto. Your Junin Sensei will be Yuahi Kuranai. Team 9 is still in circulation from last year. Uchiha Sasuke has been permitted an apprenticeship under Hitaki Kakashi. I commend you all on passing, 
and look forward to seeing you attain greatness in the name of Kanahagakur no Sato. Your sensei will be here shortly, Uruka announced, before nodding to them in farewell and leaving. Geez, two teams, technically. Granted, there are still the graduates from last year, but this year. Dot dot, I feel really bad. Not just for all the people I kept from graduating for opening my big mouth, but for what it did compared to last time. There were ten teams last time, and I just cut that down. I know mostly everyone didn't take it too hard, but still. Dot dot single quote, Naruto lamented when the sheer gravity of his actions showed itself. True, there were still some students that blamed Naruto for their failing, but it was overshadowed by the students that, with their eyes open to the truth of the matter given by both Naruto and Aruka, actually appreciated his effort and sought to better prepare themselves. Besides, it wasn't like they were going in for another four years, those negative ones need to lighten up. Now actually observing the new teams, Naruto wanted to exclaim how unfair it was that Sasuke had a sensei to himself, he understood that the gray-haired man was there just to teach Sasuke about his Sharingan once he unlocked it. And it wasn't like he wouldn't teach him extensively, he knew that from the last time, he he. Plus, Team 2 had, him. Enough said. Anyway, once that thought process was done, he noticed Kiba get up to sit beside them, filling the row with the Inazuka to his left. With a fist bump to Kiba, finding he was actually really cool about him getting all friendly with Hinata, since he expressed his, and everyone's, relief that it finally happened, coloring Naruto's cheeks at his sheer obliviousness, he turned his thoughts to eventually training with them. He technically knew all their techniques, but without a Ninkan partner, he couldn't really use Kiba's, so it was moot. Hanada, however, could help him with his Jukin, if he somehow managed to bullshit his way out of getting executed or whatever for an outsider knowing the techniques of a clan. Question was, how to go about that? A. We'll burn that bridge when we get to it. And like clockwork, the door slid open to reveal both on time Junin. Team 1. Meet me at Akmichi's barbecue. Was all Asuma said before disappearing in a shunshin. Team 2. Meet me at training ground 8. Kurinai ordered, disappearing in a flurry of rose petals. Five children blinking owlishly. Nothing phases Shino, soon split up and went their destinations, Naruto leaving Sasuke with a bit of advice to take a short nap. Of course, the last Uchiha ignored him. Hey, he was just trying to help. Training Ground 8. Kiba, Hanada, and Naruto finally appeared at the training ground and found Kurinai waiting for them. H hello, Kurinai-san. I I guess I'll be calling you Kurinai-sensei now. Hanada greeted, revealing she knew Kurinai before being in her team, something Naruto didn't notice last time. Hello, Hanada. Kurinai returned with a smile. Well, usually we'd be team 8, but someone saw fit to change that. She commented, finding amusement in Naruto's blushing face as he tried to look anywhere other than towards her. With a chuckle, she assuaged him. I'm kidding, Naruto-san. The Junin sensei were informed of what happened yesterday and, while we were initially shocked, we believe you were right. There were too many students that just weren't ready to be shinobi. Though. We didn't particularly comprehend how many until we were told, so that was a bit disheartening about the curriculum. Oh, speaking of which, Hokage-sama wanted me to personally tell you that he's going to change it, like you mentioned. She informed the boy with a smile, which he returned with joy. That was one step closer for everybody to better themselves. Anyway, with that out of the way, usually I'd test you to see if you were ready to be shinobi but. Well, thank Naruto again. Technically, the new parameters of your graduation exam contained the test I was going to give you, so of course you pass. The test would have also shown if you can perform adequately as a team, but I can train you in that. So, let's start introductions, then we can go right into training and missions, she said with false cheer, as she knew the horror that was D-rank missions, but she, like many Junin, enjoyed the look on Jenin's faces when they saw what their missions were when their hopes of saving princesses, conquering fortress, etc. came crashing down around them. Did that make her a bad person? Point is, it hyped up Hanada, if you could tell, and Kiba enough for that, but Naruto was curiously scowling. Did someone tell him? Well that was no fun. Anyo. H how do you want us to do introductions, Kurinai sensei? Hanada asked. I'll go first, then you can use mine as a base. I'm Yuhi Kurinai, 
I like shochu, vodka, and training in genjutsu. I dislike sweets, perverts, and slackers. My hobbies include having evening drinks and refining my genjutsu, and my dream is to turn you three into superb genin of Konoha. She introduced, gesturing for Kiba to go next. Hey, I'm Inazuka Kiba. I like most meats and training with Akamaru. I dislike really anything not chewy and cats. My only real hobby is walking Akamaru, and my dream to bring the Inazuka clan to glory is clan head. Kiba introduced with a grin. Next was Hanada. M. My name is Hayuga Hanada. I like Zenzai and cinnamon rolls. She blushed when Naruto nodded in remembrance. A. In training in my Juken. I dislike shellfish and people who prejudged others, and my hobby is flower pressing. My dream is to one day unify the Hyuga clan and abolish the very tradition that divides it. She said meekly, though ending with a determined, if still shy, expression. Smiling at her, Kuranai gestured for Naruto. My name's Uzumaki Naruto. I like red bean soup, ramen, and training. I dislike people who prejudge others, like Hanada chan. He took some sort of joy from seeing her blush. Dot and my hobby is really just training. My dream is to be Hokage, of course. He was forced to state the obvious, but he didn't care. It's not like that changed because he nearly died. Chuckling at his exuberance, Kuranai clapped her hands together. Okay, that's done then. So now we can move straight into training. First, I want to spar with each of you individually so we can point out your strengths and weaknesses, then work from there. Kiba, you're up first since you were introduced first. That means you next, Hanada, then Naruto. Kuranai pointed out, ushering them to the edge of the field and standing apart from Kiba and Akamaru. This spar will be two parts, Taijutsu then Ninjutsu. That means none of your clan jutsu, Kiba, until I say, Taijutsu only. Understood? She said in a voice they would come to know as her Junin instructor, tone. Nodding, Kiba fell into his clan's Taijutsu stance, Akamaru beside him. And begin. Kuranai yelled, staying in place as Kiba lunged at her, already a mark against his brashness, though that was probably a given for Inazuka. For the beginning of the taijutsu section, Kuranai would stay on the defensive to see Kiba's form and find any errors she could help him with, then she'd go on the attack to see how good he was at defending. Backpedaling, ducking, and sidestepping was the name of the game as Kiba and Akamaru's teamwork was flawless, as was expected of an Inazuka, especially the possible heir. It was still up for debate because of his sister, but she seemed complacent with her vet position, so who knows. The main problem with trying to find holes in his form was the fact that it was a clan taijutsu style, so she couldn't really critique as much as she wanted, since it would eventually go against their style, and heaven forbid she recommend a different style altogether. No, she'll stick with just finding places he could improve on, minimizing lapses in activity when he put too much force behind certain attacks that left him open or a bit of improvisation that stayed within the realms of his style. While taijutsu wasn't her best subject, that'd be genjutsu, obviously, it wasn't her absolute worse. She liked to keep that and ninjutsu trailing just behind genjutsu, so as not to become too specialized, and thus weakened. Her mental timer went off, and she sprung on the attack, putting Kiba in her previous position as she refused to let up. This section revealed numerous holes in his form, which was possibly to blame for the style. Inazuka Taijutsu was known for being aggressive and repeatedly hammering the opponent until they dropped. It wasn't the best for being on the defense, but that could be improved on. When she had felt that message got across, she jumped back. Okay, now you can begin using ninjutsu. Nothing lethal or aimed at vital points, though. She signaled. Grinning, Kiba felt it was time to cut loose. Yahoo let's go, Akamaru. He whooped, to his barking compatriot before dropping to all fours and becoming enveloped in a thin layer of chakra, the Shikyaku no Jutsu. Lunging forward at a greater speed than previously, Kiba spun until he was comparable to a drill, while Akamaru ran beside him to aid in either distracting Kuranai to be susceptible, or attack her should he fail. Suga. Fast, but nothing I can't handle. Should watch out for Akamaru, though. Kuranai observed rolling to the side to dodge Kiba and sliding her arm under Akamaru's waiting jaw and using his momentum to send him flying with Kiba. Both Jenin and Ninkan landed on their feet and turned to face her, moving right into the next attack. Naruto and Hinata were watching them from the side, the former calculative in his observations, his thought process similar to Kurinai's. A bit too direct, but slightly compensated for by having Akamaru aid him. 
From what I remember of the Chunin preliminaries, that technique and the dual variant are literally all Kiba has. He sighed. This is the problem with clan techniques. Outside of them, the individual is extremely limited, and all but dead in the face of someone who can tank through them or is too skilled for them to be effective. Hum. He took a moment to stare at Kiba with his Hakumagan active, hidden under a genjutsu. Okay, so his affinity is Earth. I should recommend he learn elemental jutsu to expand his repertoire, clan restrictions be damned. Speaking of. Glancing at Kurinai and Sidelong at Hanada, he found their affinities were fire and water, respectively. I can probably help Hanada Chan, too. Kurinai sensei is a junin, she won't need my help. With that decided, he deactivated his dujutsu and continued watching the spar, spying Kiba use his gatsuga with a transformed Akamaru. About ten minutes later, Kurinai called for an end to their spar. Okay Kiba, that's enough. Now I expect you to sit and listen to my observations of your flaws and do something about them to better yourself. She ordered with a light glare, knowing Kiba would rather ignore her pointing out his flaws like most in Azuka, or people in general who disliked having their flaws pointed out. Flinching at her perfectly pegging his personality down, Kiba reluctantly listened to her point out his flaws. First off, you're probably predisposed to immediately lunging into the fray with the intent to finish the fight quickly. We'll be working on stopping that. Jumping into a fight without knowing what your opponent is capable of is more likely to get you killed. Though I will applaud your forward thinking of having Akamaru aid your initial attack instead of both of you attacking. Your taijutsu style leaves too many gaps, either from putting too much force behind an attack, or simply not being fast enough. I'm sure you're not that proficient in it yet? She asked, receiving a slightly embarrassed nod. Makes sense, then, so you'll need to work on that at home since we obviously can't help. Lastly, even though this is something we can't immediately do anything about, Akamaru is a bit too small for certain attacks to work completely. If he was larger, my attempt to use his own momentum would have failed. With a shrug, Kurinai finished and turned to Kiba's teammates. Do either of you have anything to add? She asked. Hanada merely shook her head. And no, Kurinai sensei, you said everything I could have, she said. Nodding, Kurinai turned to Naruto for say anything. I actually have something to say. Kiba. I think relaying solely on your clan techniques is a mistake, and will sorely cost you one day. I think you should incorporate other techniques, including elemental jutsu. Naruto commented in a no-nonsense tone. Much like the academy, he said these things for the betterment of others. Kiba himself was torn between scowling at Naruto for what he observed as him besmirching his clan teachings, and giddy at the thought of elemental jutsu. Despite himself, he had more than once thought of learning techniques other than his clan's jutsu for the future. Kurinai made an impressed noise. Interesting, Naruto. I can see the merit in your words, and now that I think about it, that'd be a good idea. I know plenty of low-level jutsu that I can teach all of you, so I can help with that. Kiba. Do you know your affinity? She asked him. Uh. Was all Kiba could really say. The Inazuka clan didn't really dabble in elemental jutsu. It wasn't forbidden, or anything but there weren't that many practitioners of elemental jutsu in the clan. It's Earth. Hmm. Both Jenin and Junin grunted quizzically, turning to the blonde. His affinity. It's Earth release. Naruto elaborated. And how do you know that? Kurinai asked with a raised brow. Moment of truth. My. Dujutsu can see. Affinities. Naruto responded hesitantly, rubbing his arm. All three of his teammates blinked in shock. Why you have a dujutsu, Naruto-kun? Hanada asked with a face Naruto found really hard to look at without something hurting. Why yeah, I have one. It manifested on Saturday, and a letter from my parents explained what it could do. Gee, this a deep hole I'm digging, he explained. Kurinai suddenly went very pale. Your, your parents, you say? So, you know about them? She asked. Yeah, I thought you were an orphan, Kiba commented. Well, I still am, but I went to J.I.I. San and asked about my parents. He decided enough was enough and finally told me who they were, and gave me a letter they left. Naruto explained, a fond smile on his face at the thought of the letter. Who's, J.I.I. San? Kiba asked. Oh, that's what I call the Hokage. Naruto elaborated with a smile, chuckling when everyone nearly face faulted. He lets you get away with that. Kiba asked. Wait. Hold on, more important thing. Why did Hokage-sama keep that from you? 
That's messed up. He pointed out, letting the first question drop. Well, my dad made a lot of enemies, both inside and outside of the village, and Kumo went after my mom once, so there's that. Naruto explained without really saying anything important. Geez. What did they do? Kiba asked, shocked. Damn you, Kiba. My dad handed a village its ass on a silver platter in the last war, and my mom had special chakra and the Sandame Rakage was a greedy asshole. Naruto summarized eloquently. Nodding, since the infamous Sandame Rakage was known for his roughshod methods, seeing as how he was to blame for the Hyuga incident. As the victim of the event, Hanada was predisposed to dislike Kumo, so she could relate to Naruto's mother. However, she, as well as Kurenai, detected his evasiveness on actually giving names, and she thought about any notable shinobi that handed a village its ass in the Third Shinobi World War. Mentally cross-referencing Naruto's physical features with any shinobi of note, Hanada came to one conclusion. Naruto-kun's father is the Yandaimi Hokage. It was painfully obvious, he had his hair color and style, and his eyes, and even his tender nature from yesterday. Kurenai, of course knew who Naruto's parents were, as she was an acquaintance of Kashina, and she thanked Kami that he had the wherewithal to not mention names in front of a loudmouth like Kiba. However, from her face, Kurenai could see that Hanada deduced at least one of Naruto's parents, and probably the more obvious one, given the Yandaimi's shared features. Then she finally thought about what he actually said, she didn't know about any dujutsu from either of his parents, so maybe it just skipped a generation. Then that begged the question. What can it do? And what does it look like? She asked Naruto with crossed arms. Seeing that Kurenai didn't say anything about Naruto's evasiveness, Hanada let it drop and turned to Naruto to pay attention. Shit. I didn't think this through completely. Uh. Okay. Definitely can't divulge parts that are obviously part of the Sharingan and Byakugan. Deciding to buy some time, Naruto activated his dujutsu for them to see while thinking up some bullshit. At the sight of his exotic looking dujutsu, his teammates all let loose simultaneous, ooze, while taking closer looks. I can see chakra, elemental affinities and it allows me photographic memory, visual genjutsu prowess, affinities for sub-elements, and six paths, with their own abilities. Naruto explained, mildly annoyed he had to divulge this much information about his dujutsu, even if it wasn't everything, but if he wanted his shinobi career to go relatively unimpeded, it was a necessary evil. Kurenai blinked owlishly. That's, that's a lot of abilities. Isn't that a bit unfair? And what do you mean by paths? Are those more abilities? She asked. Hey, it's not like I made it like this. This is just how it works, or at least what the letter from my parents said. But if you're gonna be like that, I won't explain the paths. Naruto was allowed to be a little petty, right? Mildly perturbed, Kurenai huffed. Just tell us so we aren't distracted in the future if you pull some impossible crap, she recommended. Fine, but don't say I didn't warn you, he said before raising a finger, beginning to tick the paths off. Tendo, the control over attractive and repulsive forces. Shirado, transformation with various mechanical weapons. Jigokudo, interrogation, soul stealing and restoration of physical injuries. Ningandu, mind reading via soul stealing. Chikashudu, summoning any animal. And Gakadu, absorbing all forms of chakra. With six fingers up, he said this all flatly, mentally finding amusement in their gobsmacked expressions. That's. That is the biggest pile of bullshit I have ever heard. Your eyes can do all that, plus that stuff you said before. Kiba asked indignantly and not entirely unjustifiably. Did I forget to mention it can also apparently evolve? Naruto added, a minor plan in motion. So it can get even more power. That's so unfair. Kiba complained whilst throwing his hands into the air. Normally I'd talk about how being a shinobi is unfair, like yesterday, but even I'm inclined to agree with you. Apparently, it can actually assimilate the abilities of other dujutsu. Apparently, from the little bit of history in the letter, these eyes are actually the dujutsu of the first natural wielder of chakra, and thus their dujutsu actually had all the abilities of dujutsu we know of today. Their descendants were actually born with an infinitely weaker dujutsu, but they can copy others, like it's trying to get back to the prowess it once had. The last wielder, my grandfather apparently, didn't have these paths, but upon encountering someone with something called the Rinnegan, he got those powers, so that means there's someone out there with at least those crazy powers. Naruto lectured, mentally in awe at his capacity to bullshit. 
This was all by the seat of his pants. The Rinnegan? You mean the Dujutsu of the Rakudu Senin of legend? It's real. And wouldn't that mean your eyes should be the Rinnegan if they're the eyes of the first chakra wielder? Kuranai asked, eyes narrowed in suspicion. Actually, I said first natural chakra wielder. According to the legend in the letter, these are the eyes of the Rakudu Senin's mother, a woman who naturally had the Byakugan. He rested a hand on Hanada's shoulder as an example, finding she didn't really pay attention as she was deep in thought. Dot, but she gained the abilities of what we know as the Sharingan and Rinnegan by consuming the fruit of the Shinju, a monolithic tree grown from the earth soaked in the blood of those who died in seemingly endless wars. After she gained those abilities an extremely potent, nearly god-like chakra, she gave birth to twins, one of which was the Rakudu Senin, both of which were born with chakra, and thus were natural wielders. The Senin was then the ancestor of the Uchiha and Senju clans, the latter of which the Uzumaki branched off from, and his brother was the ancestor of the Hyuga clan. He relayed a lightly modified portrayal of the origin of chakra. Wow. Just. Wow. How does no one else know about this? Kuranai asked, genuinely curious. Well, considering Kiba's face, I'd say because people would feel knowing this would completely wreck their preconceptions of chakra and history. Naruto responded, gesturing to Kiba's frozen visage that gave the impression he might be catatonic. A Anyo, Naruto? Hanada spoke up to get his attention. Yes, Hanada chan. D does that mean you copied my dujutsu? She didn't look particularly annoyed if he did, mostly just quizzical. Oh, no, it's a conscious action. Plus, even if I wanted to, I wouldn't do that since I'd be stealing from you and your clan. Naruto responded chivalrously. Anyo. I if you want, you can. I can help you learn it, and maybe you can help me with my Juken. Hanada offered courageously, possibly ignoring how her clan would react if they learned of this. She didn't care, as long as it guaranteed time with Naruto. Oh. Oh wow. Uh, if you're okay with that. Hanada Chan. He asked, only to receive a meek nod. Okay then. He made a show of concentrating on her eyes, lightly blushing when it forced him to concentrate on her face. Okay, I think I did it, he announced. T try to see if you can extend your vision or change it in some other way, Hanada advised. Nodding, Naruto purposely took a while until he activated the extended vision. Whoa. I can see pretty far, he said excitedly. I should be a ing actor. Smiling, Hanada nodded. Gee good, now try and see if you can observe chakra more acutely, she advised. Nodding, Naruto again purposely took a while to achieve it, but eventually, succeeded. Hey, yeah. I can see the pathways and tenketsu. He made a show of whooping in exhilaration. Well, while this bit of Hanada sensei education hour has been fun, let's get back to training, yeah. Kuranai teased taking joy in Hanada's rapidly reddening face from her stealing the spotlight. I'd watch it. Naruto commented flatly, to laughs all around. Well Hanada, it's your turn. Remember, taijutsu first, then ninjutsu. That also means no chakra usage until then. Kuranai lectured while they got into position. Hanada's eyes widened at that last tidbit. The Juken relied heavily on the usage of chakra with their taijutsu, otherwise it'd just be them poking their enemies. The Hyuga clan was more strict than other clans about augmenting their styles or using elemental jutsu, which was why she was viewed as a failure due to her repeated attempts at changing her usage of juken to work with her flexibility. So she'd have to resort to forceful palm thrusts and even punches and kicks. Begin. Like before, Kuranai took the defensive position for now, merely reacting to Hanada's assault. Already she found a flaw in the juken as a whole. Without chakra, a Hyuga can't leave lasting damage. Granted, there won't be a lot of moments where they would be unable to use chakra, but as shinobi, they should be ready for anything. That Hanada wasn't taught this showed the flaw in clan teachings. Granted, Hanada seemed to adapt well enough, using punches and kicks to assault her. She could just see the Hyuga elders huffing in indignation. Of course, there wasn't that much force behind them, both from her lack of practicing this style, and of course her age and size. Beyond that, there were the obligatory holes in her form as a genin. Kuranai was slightly apprehensive as her mental clock ticked down towards the offensive section, but it was for the best. With that, she lunged at Hanada and began her light assault, mentally wincing whenever her blows landed. There were even more holes in this form for defense, 
but that was a given due to the lack of chakra. Finally enough time passed and Kuranai jumped away. Okay Hanada, you can use chakra and ninjutsu now, she announced. With a grateful look on her face, Hanada nodded and went through the hand seals a beginner in the usage of Byakugan required to activate it, the veins on her temples bulging as she fell into the legitimate Jukan stance. With that, she lunged at Kuranai and attacked her, succeeding where Kiba failed in actually harming her, though she had the wherewithal to unseal the tenketsu she blocked, but the pain remained. Of course, as a Junin, Kuranai was able to deflect, because blocking wasn't an option against a Hyuga, more than half of the blows, and return her own, but Hanada was able to fluidly block and deflect them, reinforcing herself with chakra. Okay, she announced, causing them to break away. That was very good, Hanada. Now of course, come observations. Of course, as a Hyuga, your Taijutsu style relies on chakra usage, so taking that away from you is a massive blow, but you showed competent adaptation. We'll need to work on your strength and speed, both for attacking and defending. Now your usage of the Jukin is great, at least to someone not from the clan. Though. I could have done without the sealed Tenketsu, even if you unsealed them. Kuranai lightly complained, rubbing her arm over one of the tiny red dots, pouting slightly, extracting a giggle from Hanada. Do either of you have anything to say? She turned to the boys. That was amazing Hanada, you were like water moving and flowing when you were fighting Kuranai sensei kiba raved good-naturedly hanada was practically glowing from her blush i agree with both Kuranai sensei and kiba you were obviously showing distress from not being able to use chakra but you seemed to manage yourself well enough in your adaptation when you were able to use chakra it became simply amazing of course i'd still recommend you learning elemental jutsu your affinity is water which seems appropriate Naruto praised, advised. Hanada's blush nearly went nuclear from her crush's praise, but she agreed with him on jutsu. Well that just leaves you, Naruto. Kuranai piped up, the blonde switching places with Hanada before he fell into a peculiar stance. He raised his right leg so he was standing only on his left, and raised his right arm above his head, bending at the elbow so the back of his hand was parallel to the back of his head, and limply reached his left arm forward. Quote dot dot dot, what the hell is that? Kiba asked flatly, it's my taijutsu style, Kakuran. Naruto explained simply. Realizing this might be part of Naruto's hidden talent from the academy, Kiba merely shrugged and remained silent. Begin, Naruto immediately kicked off towards Kuranai, going into a vertical spinning kick that Kuranai wasn't prepared for the force behind, but she managed to backpedal enough to dodge a majority of the damage it might have inflicted. Naruto didn't miss a beat and allowed himself to land on his hands, extending his legs and rotating himself as fast as he could, forcing Kuranai to put her arms up to block, wincing at the force again, before she pushed his leg back, knocking him off balance. Rolling away and rising to retake the odd stance, Naruto stepped forward and thrust his left arm forward, only for it to be deflected again, but he followed up with a scorpion strike of his right arm over his head, freeing his arm from her grasp. He used his own momentum with a light jump to spin himself and bring his heel down. She grounded her stance and blocked it as much as she could, but still grit her teeth from the force behind it. What does this kid eat? She pushed him off and swept his arm out from under him that he used to support the secondary scorpion attack. Using it to his advantage and rolling to the side before Kuranai could attack, as he realized it was about time for her too, Naruto took up a different stance to accommodate the switch. It was relatively simple, a forward-facing horse stance with his hands in knife positions, the right arm curved down, palm up, and the left raised above his head and the hand pointed forward, palm down. The position of his arm had the uncanny affect of casting his face in darkness, only his eyes visible to everyone, slightly unnerving them at the seriousness in them at the moment. Getting over that, Kuranai lunged forward and went on the attack, idly wondering why Naruto had more than one taijutsu style, but brushed the thought off. Attempting to exploit the obvious opening, even though she knew it was probably a trap, she was met with what was expected, a counter. Naruto quickly grabbed the fist she attempted to lodge in his stomach and threw it to the side with enough force to spin her, violently ramming his fist into the small of her back, sending her tumbling forward slightly, taking no pleasure in the slight outburst of pain. Kuranai got to her feet and put a hand to the rapidly bruising area, wincing from the pain, and used chakra to dull it, 
before she got back into her own stance. She was starting to regret this whole affair, that kid hit hard. But she was a Junin, so she'll suck it up, hopefully. Lunging at the boy again, Kurinai attempted a low kick at his shins, only for Naruto to block with the side of his leg and use his foot still on the ground to push her back, using his lower body as a coiled spring she stepped on. Okay then, you can use ninjutsu now, Kurinai commented, feeling a lingering sense of dread at giving him the green light for it. Nodding, Naruto took another stance. It was even simpler than the previous stance, but Kurinai now knew that might mean nothing but bad news for her. His legs were in the same stance as before, but his upper body was in a heavy slouch, his arms hanging limp in front of him, his fingers splayed like claws. Kurinai spied his hands and feet glowing with chakra-shaped like claws, wondering if this style was related to the Kyubi in any way. Shrugging that off, she lunged at him and continued their spar, immediately regretting it when Naruto swung his arm and the chakra claw around his hand extended and actually grew, smacking her in the left side and sending her skidding to her right. Yep, totally regretting letting him use chakra. Time to step it up, then. Kurinai decided, bringing herself up to Chunin levels and tactics now. The spar became pretty even after that, Kurinai using a unique brand of gentaijutsu, minor illusions masking her moves and letting her get more than a few glancing blows on the boy. Of course, given his position in the team she could already foresee, he just tanked through them and continued attacking. The longer the spar went, the more Kiba realized Naruto's stance was similar to the Inazuka Taijutsu style, but there were enough differences that he wouldn't raise a stink over it, those chakra claws were insane, though. With a final clash, both Genin and Junin jumped away from each other. Okay, time's up, Kurinai announced, panting lightly, sort of regretting facing all three of them in a row, and just fighting Naruto himself, he was indeed a stamina monster, and he could most definitely outlast her in a straight-up fight. Nodding, Naruto straightened himself and cut the flow of chakra to his extremities. That was fun, Kurinai sensei, can we do it again sometime? He asked with a broad grin. Kurinai gaped when he showed no signs of fatigue, and actually wanted to keep going, stamina monster might be an understatement. You uh, sure, Naruto. Later, now, she turned to Kiba and Hinata. Do either of you have any observations to make? She asked. Yeah. Firstly, why did you take different stances for each part, Naruto? Kiba asked a question on his mind since the defensive portion. Because I used different styles. You know I used Kakurin in the beginning, and I used Keijkin for the defensive part, and Kitsunsum for the chakra portion. I have three different styles. Two for attacking, one utilizing chakra, and one for defending. I plan to actually combine them into a single, new style in the future. Naruto explained, finding amusement in everyone's gobsmacked faces, including Hinata's adorable one. Though he noticed Kurinai's paling face, probably at the mention of Kitsune Sum. Hey Anyo, Naruto-kun, how did you come upon these styles? Hinata asked. They were also in my parents' letter. Keijkin was my father's style, Kitsune Sum my mother's, and Kakurin was compensation Kumo gave my mother for her kidnapping. Naruto answered just rolling with these fabrications. Now, as for any flaws I would point out, honestly, I can't really think of anything. Your Kakurin was extremely unorthodox, and you appear to have trained in what flaws there might have been. Keijkin was, painful, though, so far it appears to be a style based entirely on reacting. You'll most likely run into enemies that intend for you to strike first or can exploit your openings, deliberate or not, faster than you can react, so we'll work on that. Kitsune Soon was quite interesting. I don't think I've ever seen someone use a style like that with its use of chakra in extending attacks. I assume you've trained it so the chakra drain is negligible. Kurinai asked, receiving a nod. Well other than all that, we can still work on your speed and reaction time, though if you want to train in strength, warn me first. She commented, rubbing her arm, pouting at his chuckle. Well team 2, that's our first training session, so let's start on missions. She announced cheerily, getting Kiba and Hinata hyped up. Naruto scowled at his short-term future of D-rank missions, this was going to suck. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.